What's up guys? It's yo boy Amis Sensei. Welcome to a new series, What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Nara and Uzumaki, Part 4. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. I must admit, the sensations when applying seals to bare skin are quite peculiar, she confessed, as she stood up and began to dress. After a while, you start to get used to it, I shrugged. The sensations are indeed quite peculiar, it's as if thousands of tiny blunt needles are trying to penetrate the skin in the areas where the ink is applied. Alright, let's go escort you to the gate, and then we'll think about how not to attract too much attention from my fellow villagers to our meeting, I sighed, getting up and beckoning the kunoichi to follow me. What's there to think about? Reiko chuckled, stepping out of the house, you know Henge? Yeah. So, in a couple of hours, show up at my apartment disguised as someone older, here's the address, she handed me a piece of paper. Great, that's the plan, but I have one condition, silence about the seal. I don't need a huge line of people wanting the same thing under my windows. Of course, without the ability to keep silent in our environment, you won't survive long, the Jonan agreed, waving goodbye to me and leaving the neighborhood, while I headed home, unable to contain the satisfied smile that crept onto my face. Now all that's left is to find a suitable seal for the occasion, because becoming a father at such a young age doesn't seem appealing, first, it's worth having a good time. But the opportunity to blow off steam came just in time. Maybe now I can fully focus on perfecting my shinobi skills without distracting factors and corresponding thoughts when seeing individuals of the opposite sex. Oh, these youthful years. Late in the evening, jumping across the rooftops towards the Nara district, I couldn't contain the wide smile spreading across my face, reflecting my inner state after a more than heated encounter with Keiko. That's when you could start thanking the inherited Uzumaki genes, providing immense endurance even in such delicate matters. Considering that the profession of an Irionin allows miracles to be performed with the human body, one can only pity those who don't have even half of such possibilities. I suppressed the urge to maniacally burst out laughing and returned my thoughts to the divine body of the Kunoichi and my first time in this world. I can only say one thing, I didn't disappoint, and then didn't disappoint again, and again, and again. Given the intensity of the multi-hour marathon, I doubt my partner will be able to walk anywhere on wobbly legs tomorrow, if she even manages to wake up before noon. But I managed to relieve the tension quite well, and Keiko didn't complain, despite my youthfulness. All hail Uzumaki! But on a more serious note, now I have the opportunity to relieve accumulated tension with the help of a new acquaintance at least once every couple of weeks if she is present in the village, so the need to visit a brothel can be forgotten, at least until I receive the shinobi symbol. Of course, in turn, I undertake to update the seal in case of its use until graduation from the shinobi academy. Considering the illegality of indulging minors in Kanoha, it's a very advantageous agreement. And my sensory gift is very timely, no one will be able to track such escapades, so there's no need to worry about it. Moreover, no one will be watching me, I'm still too insignificant. Especially when there's a war going on and the village leaders are at the front, it's not about the adventures of the minor Nara that the remaining ANBU forces will be worried about. Actually, that's why no one has approached me yet about installing the Ayaku Fuin for regular forces, or at least the elite. If Danzo or Haruzen were here, they would have tried to recruit me long ago. Although maybe it's still ahead, and the ANBU commander left as acting Hokage isn't aware yet, but as soon as rumors about the seal spread, he might show up. However, considering my clan status and the lack of a shinobi rank, such a possibility is greatly reduced. Clan rights in Kanoha are clearly defined, and the disclosure of any knowledge they possess can only happen on a voluntary basis, otherwise the one who demands it for free will be torn apart without regard to position, whether it's the Hokage or the ANBU commander. Considering my achievements in both medicine and personal development, sooner or later, I will still come under the scrutiny of the top authorities. Considering that by that time the war should be nearing its final stage, it's better for me not to shine too much in anything other than the disciplines already designated. So, that's medical ninjutsu as a foundation, taijutsu, which is practically mandatory for any medic for many reasons, and a bit of fuinjutsu with clan techniques. No special skills in ninjutsu or kenjutsu. 
With Chidori and its variations, I'll have to wait until I become a Chunin or the situation becomes excessively dangerous. If I think about it, being known as a versatile practitioner can only harm me in the long run if I'm always taken seriously. And already, I've encountered enough disdain towards the combat abilities of medical ninjas from the shinobi visiting the hospital. Of course, not from seasoned veterans, but even many experienced fighters consider medics only good for quickly patching up the wounded, without realizing the potential of a skilled combat medic and what they can do to an enemy with just a fleeting touch. The same can be said for few and masters. Damn, Kabuto was such a combat medic, managing to almost defeat Tsunade and Naruto with Shizun alone. Lost in thought, I nodded to the guards at the gates and entered the Nara district, heading towards our plot of land. But after overcoming the outer defensive perimeter, I turned not towards home but towards the training ground. Despite having an awesome second half of the day, I missed the planned reaction speed training, and if studying a medical treatise on brain function can still be postponed, as well as Haidenjutsu training, the vital skill for the chosen profession should not suffer. So, once again, I'll have to sacrifice a couple of hours of sleep. Considering that it's already around 11, I can manage to go to sleep somewhere around 2 in the morning, even with meditation. Again, I won't be able to catch the mandatory 8 hours of sleep, but you always have to sacrifice something, I prefer the sleep of the living. Alright, those training control can take a break from their session, and you can continue with Kenjutsu, I commanded the clones, approaching closer and clapping my hands to attract everyone's attention. What's up, boss? And why wasn't there training today, one of them asked, while a pair with Bakans continued to perform their sets of strikes, acknowledging my greeting with nods. It doesn't matter now, I waved it off, since we missed the daytime session, we'll play a game of elimination now, and at the same time simulate a nighttime battle with limited lighting. Considering that the only source of light was the full moon in the sky, the task was challenging for both the clones and me. However, channeling chakra to the eyes and ears organs somewhat solved this problem. Take these, I said, unpacking several scrolls and throwing them to the clones. As projectiles in this peculiar elimination game, I used blunt training kunai without a sharp tip and cutting edge. They couldn't injure or damage clothing, but the bruises they left were impressive. I stopped throwing rubber balls that were used at the beginning last year. The next stage of training involves transitioning to real senbons, kunai, and shurikens. In addition to reflex training and avoiding thrown piercing cutting objects, throwing at moving targets is also practiced. Another application of shadow clones for self-improvement in action, blessed be the kami, its creator, whoever it may be. With seals or without, boss. With. We'll do without them separately. To increase the results obtained and reduce the number of unnecessary movements, I didn't remove the seal's enhancing weight and resistance to movement, forcing myself to calculate the throw trajectory precisely just by sound or a fleeting glance. Pain very much stimulates adaptation to the situation and intuition. Merciless to myself, but undoubtedly effective, so it suits me. Let's go, I quickly warmed up and prepared, nodding to the clones. After that, I rolled to the side and immediately somersaulted backward, avoiding a wave of kunai. Well, let's get started. By around 1 in the morning, feeling a bit battered and extremely tired, I slithered into the house with the help of shadow clones. While they tended to my body, I greedily devoured a reheated plate of rice with meat, prepared by a domestic clone. Now, just an hour of meditation to dispel the copies, and I could hit the hay. Despite what seemed like habitual use of shadow clones for many years and the developed habit of receiving information from them, I still continued such practice, although I could do without it by now. Besides better assimilating the memories obtained, meditation greatly helped distribute the chakra energy received throughout the body, almost nullifying the physical effects of the technique, improving chakra circulation and control, albeit to a lesser extent than exercises specifically aimed at such results. Let's not forget about stimulating the ability to memorize the information studied and concentrating more fully on tasks requiring solutions. But the main reason for spending a large amount of time every day was not even that, but something completely different, meditation over the years allowed me to cope with accumulating mental and moral fatigue. No one can train day and night, year after year, almost without weekends and holidays, without any method of relaxation. Nerves, they're not made of iron even for an Uzumaki. Put an ordinary kid in my place, who's been through the same, and I bet his head wouldn't be screwed on right. That is, if he can withstand such stress. In any case, some rumors about myself that I overhear in the hospital aren't very pleasant. In principle, if I had heard about a 9 or 10 year old operating on people after some catastrophe or something without blinking an eye, I wouldn't have believed it or would have thought that he's not quite right in the head. 
Anyway, in the hospital, I'm the youngest medical ninja in history, even interns are usually two or three years older, and that's when I'm already ten, not seven. An ordinary kid simply doesn't have enough intelligence for such an achievement, and the heavy workload can lead to a nervous breakdown. And it's precisely meditation, and to a lesser extent, knowledge of past life, that allow me to remain a relatively normal kid. That's why every day, regardless of the situation, I meditate, even at the expense of sleep. Amen. Opening my eyes, I rolled onto my other side, didn't I just go to bed? Then why the hell did I wake up when it's still deep in the night outside? After lying in the darkness for a while, I was about to fall back into Morpheus's arms, but in the silence of the house, I caught sounds suspiciously similar to sniffling. Damn it, damn it, damn it. When will this end? These damn nightmares annoy not only Ma but me too. It seems that this month I'm just destined to suffer from sleep deprivation. Throwing off the covers, I sat up and shook my head, trying to wake up. Something needs to be done about this because I'm not at all attracted to losing the opportunity to sleep normally at least three days a week, especially after exhausting training. With a sigh, I got up and practically blindly made the bed, rolling it into a bundle, then picked it up under my arm and trudged to Saya's room. Despite almost perfect knowledge of the house and the entire situation, I managed to stub my toe against the jam of my own door when squeezing through the doorway with my load. The desire to curse was almost irresistible, but considering Ma's attitude towards foul language, I decided not to risk it. Reaching her bedroom, I pushed the door aside and entered. Luckily, the room was a bit brighter thanks to a couple of lone moonbeams that pierced through the curtains on the windows. Ryokuen? Saya's voice came. And who else? I grumbled, dropping the bundle I brought onto the floor next to her. Making the bed, I quickly dived under the covers and reaching out, grabbed Saya, who winced, by the waist, pulling her to me as if for the first time when I just brought her from the hospital. If you need a hot water bottle to sleep properly, then I'm willing to serve in that capacity, as long as I don't have to calm you down after nightmares anymore, I sighed, and now let's get some shut-eye, or else tomorrow I'll have to get up completely shattered. Thank you, Rio, for everything. As long as there's something to thank for, I snorted and sleepily muttered, the main thing is that I won't have to pick up the pieces of you anymore, and everything else can go to hell. Closing my eyes and gradually sinking into the sleepy bliss, I fell asleep almost instantly. Hey, Kushina-chan, Mito-chan, are you ready? I rang the doorbell at the Uzumaki women's house. The academy starts in 40 minutes, and we might not make it in time for Tokusama's welcome speech and the academy's heads. The ninja academy sessions always began on the 1st of September, and unfortunately, this day fell on a Tuesday, which was my working day. I had to make quite an effort to change it to Friday, but through a little blackmail and pleading expressions, which only experienced women could resist, I managed to achieve the desired result from the hospital's deputy head. Dealing with clan teachers was even easier, on this day, classes were cancelled for incoming students. I suspect it was just an excuse to take a break from the bunch of kids for lazy Nara. Considering that most of the veteran instructors were men, this theory sounds most plausible. Kushi-chan, Ryo's already here, came a voice from inside the house, and a couple of moments later, the door swung open, revealing a slightly disheveled Mito in a twisted kimono and a pile of uncombed hair. Sorry, we just got up not long ago and we're still getting ready, could you wait a little in the living room? Ah, uh, okay, I managed to squeeze out, slightly recovering from the shock, I had never seen the elder Uzumaki in such an inappropriate state for an elder. However, thanks to this, I was treated to a very intriguing sight, the kimono, carelessly tied with a sash, turned out to have a much deeper neckline than usual, and the view that opened up made me nervously swallow the saliva that had gathered in my mouth. Catching where my gaze had dropped, Mito smirked, flicked me on the nose, turned around, and went deeper into the house, swaying her hips very expressively. Damn, I bet she did it on purpose, it may sound unbelievable, but I've experienced firsthand that women somehow sense who and how is looking at them, determining whether a man has a certain level of experience or none at all. Settling on one of the sofas in the living room, I prepared for a long wait, because even in this world, the nature of women hadn't changed, despite their chosen profession. Contrary to expectations, the Uzumaki duo managed to get ready in record time, and ten minutes later, both stood before me in quite decent attire. Kushina sported the standard attire of a kunoichi, from sandals on bare feet, tight blue pants, and a black tank top with a vest of the same color, topped with a short green and red jacket. A pouch with kunai and shuriken was situated on her left thigh, and on her right wrist, there was a seal that exactly matched a couple of my own. The kid's hair flowed freely down her back and shoulders, held back by a single hairpin in the front, preventing the strands from falling on her face. 
In her hands, she held a small portfolio. Turning my gaze to the second Uzumaki, I found that Mito, once again, did not deviate from the traditional attire, only this time it was burgundy black with a golden belt. Her hair, too, was left loose and cascaded down her back in luxurious waves. I suppose there was no time to wind them into buns. You look great, I issued a completely sincere compliment. I always look like this, the little one humorously tilted her nose. I shook my head, where was that shy girl I met two years ago? We only have about 20 minutes left, and we should hurry if we want to make it on time. Then what are we waiting for, the elder Uzumaki chuckled and pulled the kid along. It's not far to walk from here, and we should arrive just in time for the opening speech. I shrugged and followed the pair. While the elder locked the house and set the protective barrier to full power, the little one shyly tugged at the hem of my shirt and silently stared at me with her big eyes. Sighing, I squatted down and lifted her up. Considering that Kushina was still growing slowly and didn't exceed 105 centimeters against my 172, it wasn't a problem. Someone's gotten too used to riding on me, I grinned kindly, ruffling her chubby cheek. Ryo and I I, the little one pushed my hand away and pouted like a mouse on groats. Okay okay, I won't do it anymore, I laughed. We made it out of the Senju Quarter in literally a few minutes and headed towards the Ninja Academy. Despite the early hour, the streets were crowded with people, slowing us down somewhat. Considering that we had about 10 minutes left and it would take one and a half times longer to get there at this pace, I turned to Mito. Over the rooftops? Hmm, I think I'll get us there faster, the elder shook her head. Placing her hand on my shoulder, she formed another seal, and I felt the familiar pulling sensation in my stomach. Shun Chin. Whoosh. We appeared slightly to the side of the gates in the wall enclosing the Ninja Academy. After waiting a moment for us to recover, Mito grabbed my hand and pulled me along. However, we were neither the first nor the last to pass through the large gates, inside, a crowd of people already stood, future killers and their parents continued to gather, some arriving by techniques and some the old-fashioned way, on foot. We stood not far from the podium, where the academy teachers were already stationed, and began to look around. Despite the ongoing war, the faces of those around us didn't seem too worried, although one small detail didn't escape me, the vast majority of the incoming children were accompanied by one of their parents or close relatives, such as a brother or sister. There were exceptions, but they mostly concerned ordinary townsfolk. I spotted a few loners and a group of orphan children under the guidance of two Chunin. Among them, I noticed a suspiciously familiar blonde head. Yeah, Minato had already embarked on the path of a shinobi. Despite the fact that not many clan members usually attend the academy, this time the patches on the presents were present on almost every other child. I wonder if it's because the patronage over the academy has shifted to the Senju? Before I could further observe those around me, I was distracted by Toka Senju, who appeared on the podium, slightly older compared to our first meeting but still radiating power and confidence with every fiber of her being. Toka B. Chan. Kushina exclaimed happily, waving her hand and attracting the attention of those around her. For her efforts, the little one received a warm smile and a barely noticeable nod before Senju began her welcoming speech. I didn't bother listening attentively since I would soon be standing here myself, so I just glanced around, spotting all the clans of Kanoha. The Hyuga and Aburaim stood in their respective groups not far from us, in their unchanged pristine white attire and closed cloaks, respectively. Our clan was not in sight, and among the children of suitable age, there were only two, whose parents decided to teach their children at home. A small Akamichi family stood out quite noticeably, and I even recognized them from the frequent banquets of the three clans. Nearby was a pleasant blonde from the Yamanaka, who winked at me, with two boys, and in the far corner of the platform, the Inazuka attentively listened with their tailed partners. I didn't see Sarutobi or Uchiha, which was somewhat strange. While it's understandable regarding the latter, the Sarutobi clan isn't small enough to send no one for education. Of course, most of the future students turned out to be Senju, apparently fully committed to studying at the academy. In principle, it was a very wise decision for them, allowing clan children not only to find friends but also from an early age to gain influence among the next generation of shinobi and kunoichi. And it's beneficial for the clan as well. Senju finished her speech on the podium, wishing the future defenders of Kanoha success in their studies, said goodbye, and went about her business. The parents of the excited children slowly made their way to the exit, and the children towards the entrance to the main building of the academy. What class is Kushinachan in? I turned to Mito. One be on the first floor, she replied, and sitting down on her haunches in front of the little one, she hugged her for a few seconds. Come on, Kushinachan, show them all what Uzumaki are made of. 
Right, and if anyone doesn't get it themselves, don't hesitate to knock into the heads of your classmates that you don't mess with Uzumaki. I continued, spreading into a broad smile and punching my palm. I'll be the strongest of all students, databane, the little one gleamed. That's right. I've taught you a lot, and kicking the butts of a few idiots won't be a problem for you. Mito spread into an equally bloodthirsty smile. Haha, now let anyone just mention her round face and distinctive hair color, I don't envy the idiots. Waving goodbye to us, the little Uzumaki picked up her portfolio and purposefully marched towards the doors of the academy. I almost feel sorry for all the classmates who will study with her, the elder shook her head, despite the age difference of a couple of years, she's already stronger than the vast majority of children her age and will be able to stand up for herself. I don't see anything wrong with that, I shook my head in response, with her burden, one needs to not only be strong but also unafraid to wield that strength. Perhaps you're right, the fate of Jinchuriki will never be easy, Mito sighed quietly, making sure there were no curious ears nearby. Leaving the academy grounds, we walked in silence for a few minutes, each immersed in our own thoughts. If we recall the original plot, indeed, the life of each subsequent Jinchuriki became much worse than the previous one. Mito got off relatively easy thanks to her status as the strongest Kunoichi and the wife of the first Hokage. Kushina, on the other hand, had to endure attacks from those around her because of her appearance and foreign origin. The destruction of her clan and the death of the last surviving member of her family only increased the number of troubles that befell her. I won't even mention the abduction. And the final blow, the need to sacrifice her life to protect a village that wasn't even her own, sealing the nine tails into her own son. That's something you wouldn't wish even on your worst enemy. The third Jinchuriki, Naruto, found himself in an even more depressing situation. Without parents, family, or close relatives, not even a guardian, which one would expect from a Hokage. A poor orphan, hated by most of the village with all the consequences, and indifferent to everyone else, completely alone and friendless for most of his life. Yeah, a nasty trend is emerging, however. I don't even want to think about what might happen to the fourth, if there will be one at all. At least Kushina avoided two huge shocks in her life, and the rest is in her hands, I smirked, looking meaningfully at my companion. At first, Mito raised an eyebrow questioningly, but after a moment, she nodded understandingly. Scratching the back of my head with my free hand, I pushed the dark thoughts out of my mind and, looking around, led the Uzumaki to a small cafe. Shall we have a snack? Lunch break is still far off, and you, as far as I understand, haven't even had breakfast today? I offered. I don't mind, I did oversleep today and got up literally five minutes before you arrived, the elder shrugged. Considering that she had had nowhere to rush for the past few years, it's not surprising. Taking a small table in the corner by the open window, I ordered two portions of scrambled eggs, a fruit salad, several toasts with jam, and two cups of hot broth. Despite the strong preference for Japanese cuisine, the people of Kanoha didn't shy away from other dishes, the recipes of which came from neighboring countries. This mostly concerned Shinobi, for the full functioning of a trained fighter, something more than various soups, rice, and seafood is required. That's why meat is highly valued and considered a luxury on the table of ordinary people, while for Shinobi, it's the norm, despite its high cost. After paying for the order, despite the protests of my companion, I dug into my second breakfast, with the amount of food I consume, a little addition won't hurt. What time does Kushina's academy end? I asked after emptying my plates and starting on the toast. First, there's an introductory lesson, then a small physical fitness test, that's all for today, Mito replied. If you want, I can meet Kushina after class and take her home, I suggested. Anyway, I freed up most of my day today, so we can spend it together. Given that now it's possible to visit a couple of Uzumaki only once a week for a few hours, it will be a great joy for Kushina. Thank you, but today is her day, and I don't intend to shift my duties onto you, Mito shook her head. Then what should we do until the appointed time? I raised an eyebrow inquiringly. Just take a walk, besides, I haven't walked around Kanoha just for the sake of it for a long time, surely, much could have changed, Uzumaki shrugged, and unexpectedly grinned, and besides, the company of a handsome young man only adds to the pros of this idea. It's like a date, isn't it, Ryokuen? Darn it, she got me there. One, zero, I sighed, raising my hands in defeat. Maybe these few hours of waiting won't be so boring, considering the personality of my companion. Three hours flew by almost instantly as I strolled arm in arm with Mito. Given that she witnessed the very foundation of Kanahagakur no Sato and lived here for a huge portion of her life, the former wife of the first Hokage had plenty of interesting stories to tell. 
For example, I learned that Hashirama was almost as much of a womanizer and playboy as the infamous Jiraiya. In fact, he infected the current third Hokage, subsequently passing the baton to his own student. Once caught peeping at Mito and a few other Uzumaki women, the elder of the Senju brothers received such severe injuries from the hands of the enraged red-haired furies that even with experience in medicine, Hashirama needed almost a month for a full recovery from the wounds. It was precisely because of his excessive revelry that he received a fair share of reprimands from Mito, although with the assumption of the title of Hokage, Hashirama had to curb his own impulses, which the overwhelming responsibility greatly contributed to. And unlike his brother, who remained serious and straightforward almost in any situation, the first Hokage loved to have fun and goof around, possessing a number of other harmful habits, some of which were inherited by his granddaughter Tsunade. However, despite his character and attitude towards the well-being of the village, Danzo was practically a copy of his teacher, so it was even unnecessary to guess which of the brothers he followed. Considering Toborama's attitude towards the Uchiha, it can be assumed that the head of Root had personal motives in exterminating the clan of Sharingan wielders and long-standing rivals of the Senju. But all good things come to an end, and so did our hours of waiting. We arrived just in time for the end of the second lesson, which was marked by a bell that was audible throughout the academy, and waited for Kushina near the exit with the other parents. I even managed to have a word with the pretty Yamanaka, who was a widow with a pair of twins, before the crowd of children rushed out, streaming across the front of the building where their parents were waiting. Nodding goodbye to the woman, I hurried toward the entrance with Mito. Mito Obachan, Ryo and I, I. With a sigh of doom, I prepared myself and firmly took the blow of the jumping little girl, picking her up in my arms and twirling her around with joyful giggles. How do you like the academy? Smiling, the older Uzumaki asked as I lowered the happy Kushina to the ground and patted her on the head. Great. I'm one of the best in the class. Date Bane. The girl threw her fist in the air. Oh ho ho ho, I'm the one who trained you, Mito laughed, covering her mouth with the back of her hand. I felt a shiver run down my spine, and shuddered, I hated it when she laughed like that. If before the rejuvenation, that kind of laughter sounded very disturbing, now it was downright frightening. I wouldn't go near a person who was having fun like that, even for money. And judging by Kushina's twitching expression, she agreed. Fortunately, the now young-looking red-haired woman doesn't get in that mood very often. So, did you like the teachers? I asked, to distract Mito from admiring her own talent as a teacher. I was also a little curious, because before these posts were occupied by a little inarticulate Chunin, if I remember the day of enrollment of future Inoshikacho, which happened to visit before leaving for the homeland of Uzumaki. Our class was taught by a beautiful Jonin with a Chunin assistant, Kushina nodded her head, who warned us that clan affiliation was irrelevant and that we would be taught equally, without regard to the importance of our parents or the thickness of their wallets. Hmm, I recognized the hand of an old friend, Mito smirked and made a gesture to continue. Aha, uh -huh, I can imagine how some of the village's bigwigs yelled when their kids were thrown out with a kick in the ass. Despite the different worlds, there are enough freaks here that think money is the measure of everything, including shinobi rank. Only individual knowledge and skills will be taken into account, and if someone does not meet the standards of the academy, they will be expelled at once. Well, that's understandable, I nodded, but what about your classmates? Have you made any friends? Who knows, maybe it was different with my presence, though I doubt it, children will always remain children, even if they are taught to kill. Judging by Kushina's dramatically saddened expression, my assumptions were correct. They're all mean, she pouted, calling me a tomato for my red hair and round face. I grunted, biting my lip painfully. The little girl's flaming gaze didn't calm me down at all, and I laughed out loud. Mito's melodic laughter echoed in my ears. Ryo and I, I. Kushina's hair suddenly moved and began to split into nine parts, becoming eerily similar to fox tails. Oops. Okay, okay, don't get worked up, I waved my palm soothingly, only a small part of my laughter is related to your nickname. And to what then? Suspiciously asked the little thing, clenching her fists. To your classmates of course. I smiled and in one motion picked up the girl, sitting on the bend of my elbow. After all, they do not know that in just five or six years you will be a real beauty and crowds of admirers will lay at your feet, begging for attention. Really? Kushina asked shyly, somehow immediately losing all her anger and blushing a little. Of course. Have I ever lied to you? He pretended to be indignant in response, showing a loose fist behind his back to Mito, who was giggling quietly on the sidelines. Era, it looks like you already have one admirer, the older Uzumaki turned to the smaller one with a wry smile, literally reveling in the situation, and one that means a lot more than a future army. Obachen. 
The embarrassed little girl buried her face in my clothes, unable to withstand the mocking gaze of her relative. I didn't feel very comfortable either. But in the next second, I remembered something and grinned at her. I had a great idea for a way to get back at her and convince Kushina of my own words. You know, I even have a way to show you that I'm right, I said conspiratorially to the girl. Yes? You can see for yourself. So, how, I wonder? Of course, databane. Then let's go to the swings, so that no one interferes with us, I grinned, glancing at the wary Mito. The academy trained professional assassins, but they were still children, so there was a playground with swings, turnstiles, and a couple of benches a little away from the main building, under the shade of some huge trees. With the baby on my lap, I put my fingertips to the seal on my right wrist and after a couple of moments of searching through the contents, I printed out a small album of photos. I flipped through the dozens of pages and finally found the image I was looking for, a little girl of about five or six, almost as chubby as Kushina's face, but with her hair curled in two tangles, was smiling at the photographer. Doesn't that remind you of anyone? I grinned ear to ear as I watched Mito grimly recognize herself in the picture. It's, Obachan, databane. The little one marveled. And you were chubby as a child too. And I have not only this picture, but several others, much more interesting, I chuckled nastily, turning the page. It showed an even smaller Mito, only now in negligee on a small beach with a bunch of other Uzumaki. And then I saw the long-awaited sight of Mito Uzumaki, Konoha's strongest Kunoichi, wife of the first Hokage and elder of the Senju clan, blushing to the tips of her ears. You see, your Obachan also looked like a tomato when she was a child, but she grew into a dazzling beauty, I patted Kushina's head, so in a few years you'll grow into a pretty girl before you know it. It didn't take long to enjoy it, though. Me and my cheerful little girl had time to look through a couple more photos of a provocative nature, when from the side suddenly felt the arctic cold. Ryo. Where did you get those pictures? The slits in the place of his eyes and the disgusting smirk of his tightly compressed lips made it clear that someone was about to get hurt. Only the blush on his cheeks, which hadn't completely gone away, spoiled the whole impression. I suppressed the urge to swallow and hurried to answer. Gigi had given me a scrapbook of family photos, including these, which had been carefully signed. Ruji, I'll give you one when I see you. Mito snarled, clenching her fists with a crunch and emitting a not insignificant amount of CI into the surrounding space. Slowly and quietly dropping the little thing, I sealed the blackmail materials back up and began to slowly make my feet. Ru, stop right there. Come back and give me those pictures. Kushina's laughter and shouting behind me only added to my speed, and in a couple of seconds, I sprinted out of the Shinobi Academy at full speed and jumped onto the roof of the nearest house, unable to get rid of the grin that stretched across my mouth. Not such a boring day indeed. I tossed the scroll case containing my five sealed clones with nearly full chakra into the air a couple of times, and sighed as the day finally arrived for me to start repairing Saya's spine. It seemed easy to recruit five Kage Bunshin with as much chakra as possible, but in practice, the task had taken a couple months or so. Given my schedule of practicing, training, and working, this sort of thing was to be expected. To be left with almost no chakra when you have a full day of chores and worries ahead of you is highly short-sighted. Of course, I could always use Akamichi's pills, but I wasn't comfortable with the side effects. Maybe in the future they'll come up with a more usable product, but for now, chakra repair pills were draining my body's reserves quite a bit, which I, with my intense physical training and a few hours of sleep, could not allow, even with all of Uzumaki's stamina. The only good news is that the reserve has started to grow even faster with the increased exertion, but the control as a result is not increasing at all, struggling to stay at the same level. A dozen bunshin was clearly not enough anymore. Humming to myself, I unsealed the scroll and unfolded it, inspecting the five kanji humans in the middle of the restraining seals one after another. Another reason to envy the skill of the unknown Uzumaki who created such a wonder of Fuinjutsu. Although, I suspect it was Mito, because in her library, which was left to me as a reward for helping the clan survive, I found a detailed process for creating scrolls that could contain living people with developed chakra channels or artifacts like Samahata. Anyway, the thought of supplying the creation of such portable prisons, or handing out sealed clones as support, died down when calculating the cost of the materials needed, at least for one. And that's even without the protective cover being nearly indestructible. So, the small gift of Mito, which was in my hands, cost as a decent house in not the cheapest neighborhood of Kanoha. And I'm still a long way from being able to create the seals I need, let alone apply the few in with a simple touch, which is required in some stages of creation. The amount of chakra required is not worth mentioning at all. After printing out the clones, I rolled up the scroll and put it away in the pouch, setting it aside. Time, boss? 
one of the Bunshin Kage asked. For me, not a moment had passed. Hard to expect otherwise, I shrugged, or the prisoners would have starved to death from hunger and lack of air. Did you recheck the seal? The other clone asked. A few times, I nodded, blow downstairs, and I'll go get Saya, it's time to put what I've learned into practice. I used the pastime not only to collect chakra, but also to study in more depth the work of the spinal cord, its restoration, as well as the interconnectedness of the nervous system in the body, adding knowledge to the already read treatises on similar areas. Not the easiest of topics, even for those who have received a medical degree. Fortunately, the Iranians in this world favor practical knowledge over the abstruse theory of the past world, so it made my job easier to some extent. Once again studying the treatises of various luminaries of local medicine, I was amazed at the lopsidedness of the available knowledge, almost all of the conducted research covered only a few areas directly related to the activities of shinobi. For example, an experienced Irionin can reattach a severed limb in the field, but at the same time, he is unable to regrow it even if he is provided with all the necessary conditions. An eye transplant? Right now. Growing or repairing it after a severe injury is impossible. The main task of a well-trained medic is to heal his comrade and, if possible, to defend himself against the enemy. That's it. Only the best Irionin are capable of treating various nasty diseases, and even then, if we remember Hei 8 and his chronic cough, it doesn't always work. All clans are engaged in genetics and eugenics, but again at the level of trial and error, without a solid scientific basis. It simply does not occur to them that the creation of research institutes will bring much more benefit than closed clan research. And hardly anything will change in the near future, the eternal suspicion of shinobi and the desire to keep the discovered knowledge even from the closest allies contributes to the emergence of a serious break on the development of science. Sometimes knowledge is simply lost with the extinction of living carriers, as many secrets are simply not trusted on paper. Specifics of the world. And I won't say that it makes me sad, at least there is no such a cloaca of excrement in the environment as in the previous world. There are no modified foods and the air and water are crystal clear, and the people are almost universally healthy and haven't even heard of the vast array of diseases that plagued humans in the past world. The locals wouldn't understand it, but I'm willing to cling to the life I have at any cost, despite the harshness of the world outside Kanoha's walls. I shook off the unwelcome thoughts that popped into my head in anticipation of the important operation, and sighed and headed for Ma's room. Despite my confidence in my own abilities and the positive end result, the anxiety still lingered. After all, it's understandable, she's the closest I've ever gotten to the category of irreplaceable people in my life. Kachan, it's time. Writhing her hands nervously, Saya jumped up. Is everything ready? Yes, it's time. Walking over, I easily picked Ma up in my arms and headed for the stairs to the basement, smiling reassuringly at her worried look. The almost transparent hospital Yukata had been where since morning, so all I had to do was place Saya in the center of the Chikatsu Seze no Jutsu and take my seat to supervise the operation. After putting Ma to sleep with a touch, I nodded to the clones and began counting down with my fingers the seconds until the seal was activated. 3, 2, 1, go! The lines, signs and symbols carefully drawn on the floor flashed obediently and I felt the information about Ma's body begin to flow to me as if I were using a mystic hand. But this time I didn't need to maintain concentration on using the technique, the Bunshin Kage was in charge of that, giving me the majority of the leadership role. Considering the complexity of the operation, very apropos. Hashirama may have been able to apply his skills in medicine without seals and by the effort of thought, but this Fuin took into account the capabilities of ordinary people. And now the task before me was to restore communication in the damaged areas of the spine without allowing the degradation of the nerve tissue used. A job worthy of the third degree of Irionin beyond any doubt. Taking a deep breath, I calmed down and detached myself from all sensations and feelings that could distract from the goal, then slowly and carefully brought the medical chakra to the first area and started the process of forced cell division, not forgetting to bring nutrient resources under it. In this case, transforming tissue as I had done with Niji wasn't worth it, and required more chakra control than I was currently capable of. Three hours later, when my clothes were soaked with sweat and I was running out of chakra, I checked my work for the last time, and with a sigh of relief, I fell back on my heels, watching the exhausted seal go out. Congratulations boss. We did it. Ha, huh, we're the best. Finally, Kachan back on her feet. Aha, and she won't have to be carried on her hands anymore, the last doppelganger said, a bit out of tune with the cheering voices. Nodding to the copies, I wiped the sweat from my forehead with my shirt sleeve and rose to my feet, stepping toward Saya. 
With a light touch on her forehead, I removed the chakra-induced dream, and a few moments later she stirred, waking up. How are you feeling? I asked, making sure I was noticed. MMM, I think I'm okay, Ma lifted herself up on her elbow uncertainly and looked at her moving legs in surprise, I can feel them completely. Yes, we did it. The room shook with the roar of four bunshin kage jumping up and down and hugging each other. Barely able to resist such a reaction, I wrapped my arms around Saya's waist and lifted her up, placing her beside me. She couldn't stand firmly on her feet yet, but with my arm around her shoulders, she was able to take a couple steps on her own, smiling dazzlingly. I had done everything I could to prevent muscle atrophy from prolonged lying down, but it would still take at least a few months to regain motor function of the limbs. Although I will do my best to speed up the process, Ma will not be able to jump like before, despite the complete success of the surgery. Congratulations on your recovery, I smiled warmly at Saya. Given your efforts, I should be the one to offer congratulations, my little genius, she smiled back and stroked my head, I'm proud of you. You can check it out and feel it, and maybe try it, one of the clones muttered almost inaudibly, but the other doppelganger standing next to him hurriedly brought his fist down on his head, successfully dispelling him. Hearing nothing, Saya looked surprised at the now three Bunshin Kage who were trying hard to look innocent and simply waved back. Having quite certain memories and desires, I suppressed the urge to reproduce the hand face gesture with my free limb and only by a giant effort kept a neutral expression on my face, mentally thanking the clan's science of endurance. Damn clones and their chatty tongues. At Ma's questioning and suspicious look, I just shrugged. Okay, let's get out of here, and with those words, I suddenly picked her up in my arms and left the room, heading for the basement exit. Setting aside the obvious joy of Saya's recovery, there were several other clear advantages to this event. In just a couple of weeks, I would be able to delegate most of the household chores to her, freeing up at least a couple of clones, and in about three months, I could gain a regular sparring partner for taijutsu training without having to constantly hire teams, which Ma would appreciate. Of course, I had already surpassed her in skill by now, but I still lacked experience in combat. And another major reason was the opportunity to finally focus on training my Raitan element and the corresponding jutsu. Considering that so far I had only mastered and practiced two Suetun techniques to an acceptable level, learning another element wouldn't hurt, and considering the remaining 11 months before entering the Shinobi Academy, it was necessary to at least bring traditional ninjutsu up to the level of a graduating genin, as I had somewhat neglected this area in favor of other aspects of being a shinobi. Dispersing yet another Kage Bunshin, I sighed and glanced at the nearest macaw, pondering a quite legitimate question, should I start knocking now or wait a bit? I wanted to burn with shame at my own stupidity. After using clones for so many years, to only now, almost accidentally, figure out their peculiarity. Mind, boss, don't react like that, attempted to calm me down the neighboring Bunshin, momentarily pausing from forming weapons out of chakra. Genius, genius, more like an idiot. Well, everyone makes mistakes, after all, we're human, meant to make mistakes and learn from them, shrugged the clone, nobody's perfect. But it's still annoying, if I had discovered this earlier, I would have used the technique much more effectively, sighed, shaking my head. Instead of speculating about the peculiarity of some of my copies, it would be worth remembering the peculiarity of Jutsu. Despite being created from ordinary chakra, the energy is distributed in my clone in a quite specific way. Yang goes into creating a semblance of a body and a chakra system, thanks to which even the Hyuga can't distinguish the difference, while Yin goes into creating consciousness, providing the ability to think, remember, and make decisions like a real person. And that's where the problem lies, mental energy provides certain behaviors, so by creating a Kage Bunshin with certain mood or thoughts, I transmit them to the clone. And it acts accordingly to its nature, albeit with some limitations within the given task. Consequently, if I fully tune into training and apply Jutsu, then the created copies will be more focused and purposeful, significantly improving the quality of the training. The same will happen with everything else. That's how the cookies crumble. With complex techniques using pure chakra, one should always be more attentive and cautious. Shaking my head, I dismissed the unnecessary thoughts and returned to training. Obeying my will, the shadow underfoot suddenly shot out a tendril and joined the shadow cast by the experimental clone. Excellent, even some jonin would find it difficult to react in time and evade. All the exhausting training bore fruit. And considering my enormous reserves even for elite shinobi, the amount of energy spent on Ian is almost irrelevant within a distance of less than a hundred meters. So far, my record stood at 138 with maximum tension and concentration seal. Without it, 117. And now, the main attempt. 
Expanding the shadow thread to the size of a thick rope, I tried to move the clone with my will, remaining completely motionless myself. My hands trembled and began to slowly reach for the kunai pouches, but after 10 seconds, they stopped. Sighing, I dispersed the shadow. The result was as usual, minimal. And it's not about the strength of will, as I have it in spades, but about the inadequacy of hijitsu for this task. It's like trying to scoop broth with a leaky spoon, you can get some to your mouth, but forget about emptying the bowl. Any useful thoughts? I sighed, asking the clone. Clearly, the technique lacks the strength to move without simulating movements, the clone shook his head, even though our chakra is much denser and more powerful than that of ordinary shinobi, but in this case, this property won't help. And how do I get out of the situation? And you can't even arrange accelerated training with a dozen people because the clones are unable to use hijitsu. Spitting, I decided to move on to another task, extracting the yang component of chakra to create chains. The process itself was still half-baked for me, and only due to the specificity of clan techniques, and so far, I hadn't been able to create anything from the extracted energy. The exit point on the skin simply started to glow, indicating the location of the tenketsu, and that was it, despite my tremendous efforts. After struggling with this task for over two hours, I was about to switch to practicing the only Raitan Jutsu I knew when a suddenly occurring thought made me freeze, and after a couple of minutes of contemplation, I began to beat my head against the nearest tree. How could I be so stupid? Boss? Boss, what's wrong? Boss? Hey, stop destroying the macaw! The surrounding clones quickly pulled me aside, but I didn't pay much attention to them. How could I miss such an obvious property? The body leads the mind, without the body, the mind is weak, without the direction of the body by the mind, the body is useless. I moaned, hiding my face in my palms. Boss? What are you talking about? About trying to improve hijitsu and create kushina's chains. Without the direction of in, yang is useless. And if the manga indicated that the created chains consisted of yang energy, it doesn't mean there wasn't a single drop of in in them. Kushina had too much of the former and too little of the latter in proportions to use normal elemental jutsu, but she had no problem extracting chakra constructs and creating seals. It's a good thing that due to the density of the Uzumaki chakra, only we will have access to such a technique. The same solution should apply to Kage main no jutsu, a drop of yang won't affect the functionality of hijitsu, but it will enhance its impact on the enemy's body, allowing me to control their movements with just my will. Moans of disappointment around indicated that the clones grasped the essence of the problem we faced. Damn it, how much time wasted completely in vain. Alright, drop the defeated moods. Taking control of myself, I commanded the slaves, ah, uh, clones. Back to work, and I'll be testing the theory. Waiting for my target to return to its proper place, I formed a seal and focused, trying to take not only the pure energy of the mind but also to add a drop of physical energy to it. The main task was to mix such different proportions of components to get not chakra, but in with some properties of yang. The first attempt failed, as did the second, and dozens of subsequent ones. The habit of doing one thing played a nasty trick, and the ingrained reflexes proved very difficult to overcome. On the 71st try, I finally managed to extract not chakra or pure in, but the required mix of energies. The elongated shadow fixed the target, and with bated breath, I wished the clone to raise its hands. Be boss. It worked, exclaimed the Kage Bunshin, watching his limbs rise. I saw the success of my expressed guesses myself. Finally, the idea of several years of training and attempts bore fruit. Of course, the proportions were not ideal yet, and they still needed to be calculated for optimal results, but everything is solved by training and experiments. The main barrier to improvement has been overcome. Damn it, no wonder Rikudo Sanin was considered a master of yin and yang release. What opportunities open up if the user has unique chakra and perfect control? If elemental chakras are added to the mix, something even more spectacular can be obtained. It's just a pity that an ordinary person can't simultaneously extract a specific mixture of energies and at the same time transform part of this mixture into some element. Normal chakra is required for this, and unfortunately, a person only has one source, so it's either one or the other. Of course, you can try to use various manual seals, but it will require a huge amount of time for research with a doubtful result, which I simply won't have in the next decade or even more. Boss, what about trying to create chains? They should work too, one of the clones spoke with eyes gleaming with anticipation and a wide, Cheshire, smile. And the others were also experiencing no small excitement from finally achieving the goal. What if we try to create shadow clones with the necessary proportions? Will they be able to use Kage main or the chains, another one suggested, scratching his chin thoughtfully. Damn, I didn't even think about that. 
In theory, if the technique works for any shinobi as long as there are sufficient chakra reserves, then this assumption probably has a right to exist. Alright, first I'll test the shadow clone with the already tested proportions, and then I'll tackle the chains, I nodded, and looking at the evening sky, added, I might not get any results before nightfall. The first time, nothing worked for me, and the technique only fizzled out, but by the fifth attempt, I managed to achieve the necessary proportions and, forming the shadow clone technique seal, released the collected modified Ean energy. Or maybe it should be called Ean Chakra. At that moment, a clone appeared next to me. However, it looked slightly different, the form was copied correctly, but the color was only one, shadow. Most likely, the available Yang component was enough only to repeat the form, but not to imitate everything else, including the fake Kekiai Genkai, this type of clone felt even up close like a homogeneous mass, not even chakra, but simply, cool energy, different from ordinary people. How does it feel? I asked with interest, looking at the shadow clone, which in this case became truly shadowy. Shadowvik, damn. He opened his mouth several times but made no sound, then simply shrugged and waved his hand in front of himself, showing that nothing special had happened. Hmm, there wasn't enough ability to speak either, I shook my head, what about using Hijitsu? Nodding, the shadow clone formed the seal, and the dark thread that rushed towards me touched the cast shadow, instantly paralyzing it. With some curiosity, I felt my body moving on its own, jumping, running, and even assuming quite correct Taijutsu stances. Cool. Of course, I don't resist this, completely giving up control, but this is just a test, and the resistance level of the improved Kage main can be determined later. Hmm, is it consuming a lot of energy? I asked after a couple of minutes of exploring the capabilities of the technique. The shadow clone shook its head and showed with its fingers a distance of a couple of centimeters. Considering that its reserve is no greater than that of an ordinary clone, it's reassuring. This variation of the technique should be able to exist for the same amount of time as regular copies. Not bad. Lost in thought, I only noticed out of the corner of my eye that the shadow clone seemed to be contemplating something obvious and was therefore very surprised when it suddenly disappeared into the ground. Or rather, not into the ground, but into its own shadow, which then shrank into a point and disappeared. W what? What the hell? I didn't have time to be astonished for long for one simple reason. Someone slapped me on the shoulder from behind. Moreover, just a moment ago, I didn't feel anything from that side. Turning around, I saw that a shadow clone was standing right on my shadow, grinning widely with a gaping mouth and a satisfied face. Damn, how did you do that? I was not the only one astonished by the throne trick, but the reaction of the clones was less censored. The clone simply shrugged. It seems that now I'll have to test its resistance to damage. Extending my hand, I delivered a simple slap, and in the same moment, I received all the memories of the dispelled shadow clone. Well, I didn't even need a single blow. Sorting through the new knowledge and grimacing at the sensations of the unusual method of movement, I singled out the main thing, the shadow clone was able to sense all the shadows in the area in such a state, partially transferring the sensor ability, and with a simple desire and sending of chakra, moved behind me. In simpler terms, it dived into its own shadow and emerged in mine. What the hell? Boss, do you understand what will happen if we can master such a technique? Especially with your full range of sensory abilities, one of the clones cautiously suggested. We could infiltrate anywhere, as long as there's a shadow, and ignore security barriers designed for ordinary chakra. Yeah, and what will happen to me if such movements are only designed for these Kage Bunshins, I shook my head. No one should know about this possibility, even if the ability is only available to clones, all Nara will just be wiped out, another clone exclaimed, alarmed. Yeah, that's a sane thought. Perfect spies capable of infiltrating anywhere are not needed by anyone, including our village, which has a sufficient amount of dirty secrets. One or two will be left for a show, and the rest will be rooted out, just like they might do with the Uchiha in the future. No way, forget about it. Now we just need to find out one thing, will such a clone be able to use Henge? And will it be an illusion or a complete transformation? I nodded. Forming the seal, I performed the technique and stared expectantly at the shadow clone. It nodded and was enveloped in a small cloud of smoke. Strange, usually my hinge is applied without such effects, thanks to good control. We moved closer, eagerly awaiting the results. When the curtain of the technique was dispersed, we saw a small black mouse. Running my hand over it, I just smirked, I was tired of being surprised. Lifting the rodent and snapping my fingers at it, I watched its flight and subsequent dissipation upon hitting the ground. Yep, so resistance to damage slightly increases with a decrease in form. I now had the perfect espionage tool like the Ink Beasts of Future Agent Root and Danzo. So, 
Folks, we've tested it, now back to work, time waits for no one. I hurriedly urged the others. And I'll try the chains before dinner. Naturally, I failed on the first attempt. And the tenth one too, just like the hundredth. Only after two and a half hours and several hundred attempts, I managed to isolate the Yin energy and add a drop of Yang, without disrupting concentration. With great attention, I brought the resulting Yin chakra to the Tenketsu on my palm and, holding my breath, watched as a golden bump swelled over the skin in obedience to my will, and a tantalizing moment later, exploded into a golden chain flying out. Wow! I couldn't help but exclaim in surprise, and naturally, I lost concentration. The chain, almost a meter long, held for a moment and then dissipated in the air. But even in such a short period of time, I had enough to prove the correctness of the existing theory. It's almost like mixing elemental chakras to create elemental kekiai genkai. The principle is almost the same. So, the chains can also be trained using clones. Simply fantastic. Now, where to find the necessary amount of chakra for these trainings? Ryo Kuen, come to dinner. Mom's shout from the house interrupted my thoughts. I'm coming now. I shouted back, allowing the barrier of the training ground to let sound in both ways, not just one. Alright, time to eat now, then two hours for meditation, and I'll have about six hours left for sleep, lovely. Nodding to the shadow clones, I hurried back home. How good it is that Saya can walk normally again, I'm much worse at cooking. Well, in half a month, she'll be able to resume training, and I'll have a permanent sparring partner. Fortunately, Mito is completely on the mend now and currently only needs regular checkups and a little medical assistance after workouts. Remembering the recent battles, as well as the first skirmish with the nearly centenarian Uzumaki, I suppressed a shiver, I've never had so many bones broken in just an hour and a half. I would say she's currently at a level exceeding Jonin specializing in Taijutsu and is confidently moving towards the Kage level. At least another half a year, and with Hiruzen in hand-to-hand -hand combat, she'll definitely be able to compete. Of course, I still forbid her from using ninjutsu, even shadow clones, because the Kekiai Genkai is still weak, and straining the not yet fully recovered chakra channels is dangerous. But Mito can already use seals in battle without any problems, regaining control over her reserves. I both dread and look forward to the day when I can fight an opponent at the Kage level. That will truly be a unique experience. I need to strengthen my bones and muscles as soon as possible, otherwise, at this rate, I'll have to give up sparring with a relative who's not used to holding back. Boom! Ow! Detaching myself from the tree I crashed into, I slowly slid to the ground. Ha ha ha! Through the buzzing head, a ringing laughter broke through, and I grimaced. There's nothing funny here, catch on! Ah! Gust chien! For the umpteenth time, I crash into these stupid trees at full speed. Quickly healing my twisted nose and the bump starting to form on my forehead, I got up and shook myself off. This was the sixth attempt to master the technique of fast movement under Saya's supervision. After she fully recovered, which took about six months, I hitched her up for full-fledged training sessions in any free time, including techniques that are mainly taught to Chunin and Jonin. Children under 13 or 14 simply don't have developed enough bodies to withstand the strain of using Shunshin, but since I have Uzumaki blood and am much stronger than many adults, convincing her to teach me turned out to be much easier. But that didn't save me from humiliating mistakes that any beginner would make, much to Saya's amusement. I suppose it looks really funny from the outside, so I'm not going to take offense, but can't you laugh a little quieter? Irritated, I sighed and once again formed the seals of the technique, moving a hundred meters away to an open space. Since there was nothing to crash into, I arrived at the desired location intact and unharmed. The most difficult part of Shunshin is not in its execution, but in the small requirement for the user, it's necessary to clearly visualize the entire path and the final goal of the movement. Because the body moves at enormous speed under the influence of chakra, the eyes and brain simply don't have time to react to the obstacle that appears. That's why collisions with trees happen. It's also good that chakra-reinforced muscles dampen almost all of the impact without any problems, otherwise, getting a fracture like this would be ridiculous. That's it, forget it, I won't try to learn it on my own, I spat on the ground. Kage Bunshin. Twenty clones appeared next to me. All right, guys, let's get to work. I issued a valuable instruction, then headed to rest near mom, who had settled in with all the comforts on the edge of the training ground. Don't worry, nobody masters taijutsu on the first try, she tried to comfort me as I wearily slumped into a chair nearby. I was only able to use Shunshin no Jutsu properly after a week of active training, and even then, I ended up in the hospital twice with broken bones. And you want to master it in one day. 
Yeah, yeah, I know all that, but it doesn't stop me from striving for the best result, using all the possibilities, including clones, I waved off. By the way, have you thought about my proposal? A couple of weeks ago, I raised the issue of starting a family business, selling seals in our own shop. Since after mom recovered, I flatly stated that there would be no return to service, even if I had to use the knowledge of Fuinjutsu to seal chakra, we needed to find some other source of income. In this case, the seal shop turned out to be the perfect solution, it doesn't give me a headache, and Saya will have something to do. Mom took a couple of weeks to think it over, which have already passed, and I wanted to know what decision was made. Given the shortage of Fuin in the village, it's not a bad idea, she nodded, but if you think I'll spend the whole day behind the counter, you'd better come up with something else. No problem. At first, of course, I'll have to stand in, but I'll either substitute for you or do it myself, or my Kage Bunshin will, I replied happily, and then we can find someone from the retired shinobi or someone from the clan who's willing to work. Fair enough, mom agreed. The main thing is, do we have enough money to buy land and build the shop? Or at least to buy a loss-making place? Since I wasn't familiar with land prices and, furthermore, couldn't even clarify the required amounts legally, due to my young age, I had to completely rely on Saya in this matter, including as a family treasurer. Considering that we have just over 4 million Rio in total, it should be enough for construction, but just barely, mom scratched her head thoughtfully, and considering your soon enrollment in the Shinobi Academy and even fewer hours working in the hospital, we may find ourselves in a somewhat difficult financial situation until the shop is built. At another 200,000, we still have some left from selling the seals to our own, I added. Still seems a bit tight. It's better to look for an already built shop and buy it from the owner. That way, we can start trading almost immediately and spend less money on construction. It would also be desirable not to have to travel to the other end of Kanoha from here, I added, slightly grimacing from the returning memories of crashing into a tree, the expression, to run into a tree, in this case took on a completely literal meaning. Then, if we're looking, it should be in the center or on the outskirts near the wall on our side, Saya agreed, actually, the location doesn't matter as much to us as it does to other merchants, we won't have to look for buyers, they'll come to us. The benefits of having no serious competitors. Then, will you take care of that? We need to get everything done before I enroll in the academy. I can make various seals with the clones right now, but we'll need to buy paper and ink, and as for setting up the shop's defense, that can only be done after its purchase and renovation, which will take at least a couple of weeks of work for me alone. Perhaps, for the search, we'll have to involve someone from the clan, Saya sighed, maybe Nami knows someone who can help us with the purchase and paperwork. Hmm, I haven't interacted closely with her enough to have an idea of Nami's capabilities, but considering the extensive connections of this lively member of the Nara family even beyond the clan walls, it's quite possible. Then you talk to her, and if there are several options, we'll choose, I agreed. Okay. All right, all my clones have dispersed, so it's time for me to work myself, I nodded to mom and, getting up, stretched a bit before heading off to train Shunshin. I hope our trading venture will be successful and bring in a stable income. Of course, with the lack of proper Fuinjutsu masters in Kanoha, we're practically doomed to success, but considering the almost complete lack of experience in trading and even less in handling various necessary documentation, uncertainty still remains. Exactly a month later, I was approvingly examining the two-story house with all amenities that we bought from the village, with an excellently equipped shop on the ground floor. In addition to the house itself, located on a small street between the Nara and Yamanaka clan quarters, there was also a decent piece of land behind it, equipped as a training ground. Previously, all of this belonged to some shinobi, but he had the misfortune to die early in the war, leaving no heirs. Considering his refugee origin, all documents for ownership of the land went to the village treasury. The opening of the shop was quite funny altogether, as soon as Nami heard about mom's desire, she immediately dragged the fund keeper to us, Tensei Nara, who was responsible for the clan's financial affairs in the absence of Shinisu. He offered to fully pay for the purchase of land and building construction in any convenient place for us, with the right to priority execution of the order in the clan storerooms and a 50% discount for all Naras. Considering that the usual discount is about a third, it was quite an acceptable offer. And it gets even better. It hadn't been a couple of days since the start of the search for a suitable place, when the commander of the Umbu himself showed up and, after saying a bunch of compliments to mom, found out if the rumors were true and very politely asked about the quality of the master's work. And as soon as I showed him a couple of samples, he immediately asked if we wanted to conclude a contract for supplying seals to the Umbu with a hefty bonus of exemption from all kinds of levies. As it turned out, 
merchants who contribute directly to the strengthening of the village's forces received lots of different perks. Starting from the cancellation of most taxes, more complete access to the part of the public library closed to ordinary residents in the service of family members, and ending with preferential prices for hospital services, as well as ordered missions and an increased level of performing shinobi. The difference in payment was covered from the village budget, as in the case of the daimyo's rule. As a result, a quite impressive list of privileges was obtained. That's what it means, supplying a limited resource in conditions of a form deficit. But who would have thought that there would be such demand for quality fuin, and such a big one would come to us? I was drawing various seals in batches at Saya's request and stuffing them myself, just in case, so it was a big surprise for both of us. It was at the commander's suggestion that we quickly found papers for a dozen suitable places in the archives, from which we chose the best option. The purchase cost us only 3 million rio, practically for nothing, considering that the real price of such a house with land is about 8, and that's without markup. The only condition of such a luxurious gift was six months of work for the umbu from the conditional opening of the shop. Considering that in a day one clone with a tenth of my reserve can draw about a hundred different seals, you can imagine the production quantity per month. And all of this will be bought by the village. Of course, I was handed a list of desired seals, but there was nothing particularly difficult there. Explosive, shocking, basic barrier, chakra suppressing, paralyzing, and sensory. Everything that was previously supplied by the Uzumaki. Considering that I only saw the first two for sale, I'm ready to bet that all the seals being sold will go straight to the front line. A month of renovation and reconstruction followed the purchase, also paid for by the clan. They even dug and reinforced a basement floor for me at my first request. Saya took care of the necessary furniture, and I undertook to erect protective barriers both on the entire territory and on the house itself, allocating space for the shop. I had to work hard, but digging through the Mido library, I found a standard way of building protection, which was used by former Fuinjutsu masters living in Kanoha. It was very lucky that among the gifts given by the red-haired relatives, there was a small artifact specifically designed to support and feed security seals, barriers, and other stuff requiring chakra for their operation, such as lighting or water. We have almost the same thing at home, but with a larger volume. It's enough to pour in one of my reserves, ensuring normal operation of the entire system for about six months, not counting unforeseen situations like infiltration attempts. Of course, it took a lot of time again, albeit with the use of a larger number of shadow clones at the cost of a slight migraine, but after a very insignificant amount of time compared to the scale of the work carried out, the house was fully ready. As a small bonus, Jinjutsu specialists from the Umbu hid the entire building under a stable illusion, allowing only Shinobi and Kunoichi of Chunin level or higher, besides the owners, to notice the shop. For Genin, the arsenal of seals sold in regular weapon shops or issued in the arsenal will be enough, and if necessary, their teacher can also stock up. In my opinion, it's a very sensible idea. After turning off the annoying alarm clock, I rubbed my eyes and, throwing off the blanket, sat up. Ugh. I don't feel like getting up, especially if I remember what day it is today, the day I enroll in the academy for the final year. With a sigh, I looked at the peacefully sleeping Saya nearby and, restraining the curses from the stiffness resulting from yesterday's intense physical training, got out of bed. Yeah, it wasn't worth pushing myself to almost complete chakra depletion yesterday or going to bed at 4 in the morning. The alarm clock showed only 6 o'clock in the morning, and there was enough time before classes for me to get myself together, do my usual training, and have a hearty breakfast. Without much effort, I created a couple of shadow clones without seals, and I sent one to the bathroom while the other started preparing breakfast for two, even if mom gets up later, a small seal on the bottom of the plate won't let the food get cold. It took about 20 minutes for morning procedures, washing, and subsequent hair styling and braiding of my luxurious locks, and when I changed into clean, pre-prepared clothes, breakfast was already on the table, and the clone dispersed upon my arrival. Finishing rice with boiled eggs and meat salad in one sitting and washing it all down with a cup of tea, I washed the dishes and headed out for a warm-up jog before the morning training session. Since the training seals had only recently been upgraded to the next level of intensity, after an hour and a half, I crawled back into the house soaking wet and quite tired. Since there were still a full 60 minutes left until D-Day, I allowed myself the luxury of soaking in the bath for a bit. After properly drying off after the water procedures and tossing my sweaty uniform into the laundry basket, I came across the half-asleep Saya, who was almost feeling her way around and swaying from side to side. Mom never excelled in instant reactions, and even more so since the injury, so the disheveled hair and semi-zombified look always made me want to laugh, 
suppressed only by the realization of imminent retribution if I couldn't hold it in. Good morning. Mo Runing mumbled mom indistinctly without opening her eyes and began to collapse onto me, bath. Catching her and catching the sleepy murmuring, I just snorted with laughter, such scenes in the morning happen at least once a week. Man, I wouldn't mind being pampered like that too. They say you get used to good things quickly, so Saya wasn't going to give up some of the habits she acquired during her illness. Well, you can indulge a little, considering there's still plenty of time to spare. Without 29, I finally got the opportunity to pull out a long-prepared set of clothes, consisting of light shinobi sandals with a black toe, gray umbu style pants with one shuriken pouch on the belt, a tight-fitting burgundy tank top, and a loose hood like some of the aburame. Funny to say, but I even had to ask clan members to find out the only store where they prefer to shop. That's where I bought, in addition to my outfit, several pairs of special light-sensitive goggles that fit snugly to the face, leaving no gaps for dust and dirt. It's especially useful to have such things in the desert or when traveling at high speeds. Quickly putting on my clothes, I looked at myself in the mirror and was pleased with what I saw. Although it seemed like something was missing. Slapping myself on the forehead when I remembered the gifts from the previous birthday, I rummaged through the drawers and pulled out a pair of black fingerless gloves and a dark blue mask that mom gave me. All set for service. Granted, now I look more like another representative of the Aburame than a Nara, but who cares? It was already 8.50 on the clock, so I quickly grabbed the bag with writing supplies assembled last week and a couple of scrolls with a set for all occasions, and rushed out onto the street. Mom, I'm going. Good luck. And don't forget the enrollment papers. I got them, I shouted back in response and, making my way to the garden in front of the house, formed the seal. Shunchin. Finding myself in front of the gates to the Shinobi Academy and slightly scaring the passing ordinary parents of the incoming kids, I was glad that the protection of the house and the clan quarter allowed me to use Shunchin when leaving the guarded territory, otherwise, I simply wouldn't have made it here before 9 o'clock. And now, there were still a couple of minutes left before the head of the Senju would give a welcoming speech. Without paying much attention to the wishes and other propaganda nonsense about the will of fire coming from the podium, I simply observed those who were enrolling this year. Surprisingly, this year there were about half as many newcomers as last year, and now two-thirds of them were non-clan members. Apparently, with the increasing tension between the villages, children in clans began to be born much less often. It's understandable, when you don't know what tomorrow will bring, you don't really think about continuing the lineage. As soon as the opening speech ended, everyone slowly made their way to the main entrance of the Shinobi Academy, and along with them, I did too. After finding out in which class and classroom my group would be, I headed to the fourth floor, but on the second floor, I was almost knocked off my feet. Ryo and I, I. Just from this cry, I recognized the unknown aggressor, or rather, the little and cute red-haired aggressor who hung on my back. And who recognized me in this new outfit? Although, I left my hair visible, and I don't see any other redheads around, I thought. Hi, Kushinachan, I greeted, patting the girl on the head, which stuck out over my left shoulder, and freeing my face from the fabric. How are you doing? I hope no one's bothering you. Ha, huh, I beat up everyone who tried, databane. Well, I didn't expect anything else, I smirked, taking the little girl off my back and finally turning to face her. Over the past year, Kushina finally started to grow and stretched out by a whole 10 centimeters, reaching a whole 1 meter and 15 centimeters. Of course, she was far from my result, and she didn't catch up with the vast majority of clan children like the Akimichi or Senju, but against the background of the rest of the kids her age, having such height wasn't bad. Ryo and I, I, why didn't you tell me you're also going to the academy this year, the girl suddenly pouted, and I felt myself starting to sweat profusely all of a sudden. Worse than an offended Uzumaki is an angry one. I was going to surprise you, but as you can see, you found me first, I shrugged, looking at the smile that appeared again and realizing with relief that the excuse worked. Kushinachan. What are you doing there? You forgot we have a lesson starting? And that you can't run in the corridor, not to mention jumping on unsuspecting people. Further conversation was interrupted by a loud cry breaking through the noise of the rushing students, and another little girl, almost the same height as Kushina, joined our company. Oh, I greeted Ryo and I, I so everything's fine. Kushina laughed awkwardly and scratched the back of her head. Your friend? I raised an eyebrow. Yes, let me introduce you, Mikoto Uchiha, we're in different classes, but we quickly became friends, Kushina said. Pleased to meet you, the girl bowed. Black hair, dark eyes, and the Uchiha fan on her clothes immediately gave away her affiliation with the clan of the wielders of one of Konoha's dojitsu. It's interesting how they became friends, the girl looks about 10 or 11 years old, 
which means she's only a class behind me or even parallel. But that's unlikely, all clan members are placed in class A and this is Ryo Nara, Uzumaki now introduced me. But he's only half Nara, and his dad is Uzumaki, so we're distant relatives. Pleased to meet you too, I return the bow. Hmm, so this is what the future mother of Itachi and Sasuke looks like in childhood. I must admit, the short haircut suits her just as well as long hair, slightly resembling a little Itachi. The fact that you've started making friends is good, I smiled, then squinted cunningly, but what about friends? Kushina instantly lowered her head and began to fervently pick at the floor with her toe, while Mikoto chuckled quietly into her hand, avoiding looking at me. Oh, really, do you like someone in the class? I realized, to my horror, that I sounded a lot like Mito. Damn. Who could it be, the little Uchiha said thoughtfully, her eyes twinkling mischievously. Maybe a cute blonde boy, the only one you haven't beaten up among all the boys? Especially since he never insulted you? Miko-chan. Kushina exclaimed, embarrassed and indignant, and I felt it becoming harder to keep a smile on my face. Damn again. Is this fate? Okay, childhood attachment doesn't mean much, especially since Minato is probably fully focused on studying and probably doesn't even think about having a girlfriend. He's not at that age yet. I hope. Alright, girls, I have to go, and you too, so study hard, and you can think about romantic interests after becoming Genin, I chuckled, then tousled both their heads and put the mask back on. Bye, see you later. Already out of sight of the two girls and heading up to the next floor, I heard the beginning of their conversation. And is your Ryo and I going to teach at the academy now? No, he's entering the last year. He's only 11? Well, yes, can't you tell? He's only 4 years older than me. But he's so, huge. Could it be? I didn't hear anything else, but as I ascended to the 4th floor, I couldn't stop grinning. It wasn't for nothing that I strained so much during training, physical development led to a spurt in growth, which only slowed down a bit in the last year. Finding the classroom I needed, for A, I entered just as the bell rang to signal the start of the first lesson. Excellent punctuality. Ignoring the interested and curious looks of the children sitting at their desks, I walked straight to the blonde, attractive woman in ordinary civilian clothes and a chunin vest, who was standing at the teacher's desk, and presented her with my papers. After reading the enrollment forms confirming that I would indeed be studying in this class, she raised an eyebrow in surprise, looking me up and down. Considering the fact that I was half a head taller and one and a half times wider than her, it did look strange. 11? Nara? I nodded. And where do they feed such big ones? Senju muttered to herself, not paying attention to my chuckle, then turned to the class. Attention, everyone, it seems we have one more person joining you, so welcome your new classmate. Ryo Nara, nice to meet you, and I hope for fruitful cooperation, I slightly bowed. Great, you'll get to know your new classmates better later, but for now, take a seat in the available one, and I'll start the lesson, the Chunin urged. The only available seat from the first three rows was next to a shaggy, skinny boy with the Inazuka clan markings and a small puppy on his lap behind the third desk. That's where I headed. Nodding to my new neighbor and settling into the creaking bench, I focused all my attention on the teacher. So, first I'll introduce myself, since someone here doesn't know me, and the rest might have forgotten. Kanade Senju. You can call me Kanade Sensei or just Sensei. And first of all, I want to congratulate everyone on moving on to the next year of education. This year will be the last for all of you, and it will determine whether you pass or not. Coming to a halt, Senju swept the quiet class with a serious glance. But don't hope that everyone will succeed. This year, there will be a lot of practical training, ninja training in addition to the subjects you already have, and slacking off won't be tolerated. Your life depends on how well you grasp all the lessons, so try to approach your future lessons with all seriousness. The Kunoichi continued speaking, but I gradually stopped listening to her, realizing that her further speech would only intimidate the students and urge them to take their studies seriously. Instead, I began to discreetly look around, examining my classmates, and perhaps future teammates. There were just under 20 of them, 18, but what immediately caught my eye was the excellent physical condition of each one, regardless of gender and size. So, they train seriously at the academy even non-clan children, not distinguishing by origin. Well, that's good. Of course, the only Akimichi in the group looked more like a ball, but even under his skin and layer of fat, muscles bulged. From our clan, there was only me, but there were two Yamanaka twins, vaguely familiar to me. I had seen them with Inoichi a few times. I'm not very sociable to know their names, but not for long. Inazuka were also present in duplicate, but the second boy was hiding further away in the gallery, not allowing himself to be examined closely. 
There wasn't a single Uchiha in the class. But the Hyuga were leading in numbers, four people from the side branch and one from the main. And when I looked at the only girl, I felt like rubbing my eyes, two seats away from me sat a spitting image of Hinata. The same short haircut of blue hair, the same little nose, and even a similar jacket, hiding the figure. The only thing spoiling the view was the headband on her forehead, a mark of the side branch of the Hyuga clan, covering the seal. Strange, she should be from the main branch and have a clear forehead if you remember the manga. Either my knowledge of the plot has failed me for the first time, or the seal can be removed, and I tend to lean towards the latter. Hmm, I'll have to find out more about this. In addition to the teacher, Senju was accompanied by two boys and one girl, and unlike the first one, all three were dark-haired. The boy sitting to the right of me across the aisle wore the Sarutobi emblem and looked eerily like a young Asuma and Hiruzen combined. If I'm not mistaken, he would be the Hokage's eldest son. Who would have thought we were the same age? And two Aburame cloaked in robes completed the list of clan children. Generally, among them, it's mostly men who go into combat, while women monitor the development of beetle colonies and engage in research. How do you know these are girls? The upper part is noticeable even under their clothes. The whole lesson went something like this, I listened with half an ear, but thanks to my glasses, I could freely examine the surrounding children, as well as assess the chakra levels of each. And I must say, I wasn't disappointed. Except for the Aburame, whose chakra was mostly consumed by the beetles, even non-clan members had a decent amount, not to mention the rest and the Senju, who had about a quarter of my volume. Considering that such reserves are usually only found in experienced tokabetsu jonin or even jonin, there's something to be proud of. As soon as the bell rang, most of the class rushed to the door, joyfully chattering and laughing. Hmm, even training to be killers didn't take their childhood away. Among those who remained in their seats was a copy of Hinata, as well as my neighbor, who had been curiously eyeing me. I should get to know him, and then try to find out more about the Hyuga. Nice to meet you, man, I reached out. Ryo Nara, I prefer when people call me by my name without suffixes. Inazuka looked at my hand as if it were a venomous snake, nervously twitched his eye, but still shook hands. Just at that moment, I felt a strong stomp on my foot, and the puppy on the boy's lap growled menacingly. Inazuka Tsum, and I'm a girl, the boy introduced herself with a slightly hoarse voice, baring her teeth in a friendly smile and trying to crush my hand. Damn, I feel like I'm in for a fun year. Having gotten used to taking her son to the Shinobi Academy, Saya retrieved letters from the mailbox and returned home. There was still a little over an hour before the shop opened, allowing her some time to relax before the start of the workday and think. If someone had told her earlier that she would own her own business in the future, she definitely wouldn't have believed it. Sighing, Nara sat down, pushed the letters aside, and eagerly began to finish the leftover tea, lost in thoughts about the past and the determined red-haired child who had slowly but inevitably changed her life, showing no signs of stopping. The former Kunoichi's chest filled with warm pride at the thought of her son's successes. And although there were moments in his life that she didn't approve of, considering Ryo's sometimes excessive caution and seriousness, Saya preferred not to interfere. The past two years had allowed the mother to get to know her son more fully, and if the future Genin thought that nobody suspected his little and big secrets, he was in for a big surprise. Nara was well aware that all children eventually grow up and emerge from parental care, but with Ryo, it took on a completely new meaning. She couldn't even remember a time when the red-haired genius was just a regular child, not a little independent adult. At least she could admit to herself that she was absolutely unprepared for the burdens of parenthood by the time Ryo was born, despite trying to live up to it, despite some dislike for the role of a model wife and mother. No, the love for her family hadn't disappeared anywhere, but at that age, she didn't want to be trapped in the cage of emerging responsibilities. It was precisely for this reason that Saya was so delighted with her perfect child who didn't cause unnecessary worry. The attempt to return to service was just a whim to free herself. And where did it lead her? Over time, the situation changed, but the time was missed, the charming red-haired child unexpectedly grew up and matured. She couldn't sing lullabies to him anymore or rock him to sleep. Such thoughts always stabbed her heart unexpectedly. Finishing the almost cold tea, Saya shook her head. Although Ryo no longer needed her help as a mother, taking care of her since that terrible incident, she had firmly taken on the role of training partner and teacher, witnessing firsthand the rapid growth of the future shinobi. And what's more, before the injury, she was only a jonin on paper, but in reality, she had come close to the strength of a normal jonin, but now, after intensive recovery training with Ryo, the kunoichi not only regained her lost abilities but also surpassed the previous level, continuing to grow and improve slowly. 
This opportunity to always be close to her son allowed her to peek behind the label, genius, imposed by the clan, to understand a little the thoughts and aspirations wandering in his mind. Just a little, because who can say they know all sides of even the closest people, even after living together for many years? Well, except for the Yamanaka, and they can only dig into memories. However, what mother would refuse to check on her son's affairs? A few quick glances at the scattered notes in his room only confirmed her firm belief that the Raisingan was not the only technique personally invented by Ryo. A small note on the Raikiri technique and the inscription, suitable for Ma, gave it away. Understanding perfectly well how any shinobi cherishes personally created techniques, the Kunoichi did not allow her curiosity to overcome her sincere respect for her son's abilities. Eventually, just like with the Raisingan, he would tell her and show her everything, as long as she had patience. Chuckling, Saya glanced at the still unopened letters on the table and grimaced, there was no point in guessing their contents. Invitations to various clan celebrations or events for her and, of course, her son. After Ryo enrolled in the Shinobi Academy and the shop officially opened, about three months had passed, and suddenly such invitations began to arrive. First from the Huga, then from some village council members, making up the second half responsible for the civilian population, not hereditary killers, but clan merchants. Then gradually invitations came from other clans. Achiha, Inazuka, Sarutobi, and even Aburame. The small clans didn't even need to be mentioned. Old allies were not so insistent, but there were rare but quite unequivocal hints of strengthening relationships. Saya frowned, remembering the rumors about the clan heads, drunken talk, yeah, show me someone who believes that, and made a note to knock her brother on the head for advertising his son like that. He had almost certainly done it at his father's behest to raise the clan's prestige, so all interested parties had the opportunity to watch Ryo's progress very closely, and when he entered the academy, there was a great chance to round up such a talented child. In fact, at that age, all men would start thinking with their lower heads instead of their upper heads, losing their minds at the chance to feel a woman's charms. Saya grinned, remembering the attempts of future Kunoichi to make friends with her son using their bodies, complete indifference was their response, and in some particularly insistent cases, a wish to grow up before trying to seduce anyone. Nara could guess the source of that indifference, though, Ryo had already found someone. The small, forgotten mark on his skin, the faint odor of someone else, and the look of contentment on his face, so familiar from her husband, gave it away. Saya's blood boiled and her hands clenched into fists at the thought of the creep running his claws into her innocent son. Unfortunately, attempts to hunt down and tear the slut to shreds had failed due to Ryo's overcautiousness. After several attempts and failures, she abandoned the idea and relied on her son's prudence. The Kunoichi didn't want to get grandchildren from someone unknown, nor did she want to have a political nightmare on her head if the mother turned out to be from another clan. But she was reassured by the small seal on her son's body that Ryota had once used, so Saya decided not to bring up the subject, though she was somewhat concerned about the early activity in this regard. The only good outcome from this development was that the attempts at seduction were simply ignored. Apparently, several months of failure had exhausted the patience of the parties concerned and attempts to get Ryo began to be made through the closest person to her, her mother. The sudden invitations and suitors had surprised Saya at first, but timely warnings from a few gossipy clan friends had cleared things up. In one decisive move, she swept the stack of letters from the table into the trash, and with a smirk, went to get dressed and ready for the start of the workday. Let them try to take a bite they'll choke on, and the not-so-little Ryo still loves and cares for his kachan more than anyone else. And now the rare occasions of waking from nightmares, when Ryo was always there to give her the peace and comfort she needed, only confirmed this confidence. It is not for nothing that they say that a mother is the whole world to a child. This is essentially a brief chronology of events that I try to adhere to when writing fan fiction. Compiled by one of the readers and edited by me. P.S. It was compiled before the end of the pain arc, when there wasn't much information available regarding dates. Ryo age 9, Hataki Kakashi, Achiha Abito, Rin Noera, Yuhi Kurinai, Sarutobi Asuma, Marino Ibiki, Gekko Hei 8, and Terumi Mei are born. Ryo age 10, Yujido Ni, Momochi Zabuza, and Meidogai are born. Ryo age 12, Midarashi Anko, Hagen Kotetsu, and Kamazuki Izumo are born. Ryo age 13, Yumino Iraka, Tenzo Yamato, and Yudakata are born. Ryo age 15 to 18, Jiraiya trains Yuhiko, Konan, and Nagato. Ryo age 16, Yukushi Kabuto is born. Kakashi becomes a genius. Orochimaru begins his experiments with Hashirama cells. Ryo age 17, Achiha Itachi is born, and Hana Inazuka is born. In this year, Hataki Sakumo commits suicide. 
Ryo age 18, the first iteration of Akatsuki is formed, with only Yahiko, Conan, and Nagato for now. Ryo age 19, Sasari of the Red Sand kills the third Kazakage at age 15 and leaves the village. Ryo age 20, the birth of Temari and Haku. The fourth Kazakage is elected. Also, the third Great Ninja War was supposed to start in this year. Ryo age 20 to 22, the third Rakage squad clashes with a 10,000 man army. He orders his comrades to retreat, while he stays behind to cover them. The battle lasts for three days, at the end of which the Rakage dies. Ryo age 21, Kankuro and Yugo are born. Ryo age 21 to 22, Minato encounters the future fourth Rakage and Killer B in battle. There's an attack on Kanoha near the Uchiha district, where Itachi, witnessing the corpses of civilians, becomes a pacifist hating wars. Ryo age 22, Niji Hyuga, Tenten, Rock Lee, Sai, and Uzumaki Karen are born. Kakashi becomes a Jonin. The Kanabi Bridge battle happens, Kakashi Gaiden. Minato fails a strategically important mission. Uchiha Madara finds Uchiha Abido. The third great ninja war ends. Minato Namikaze becomes the fourth Hokage. Ryo age 23, Naruto Uzumaki, Sasuke Uchiha, Sakura Haruno, Hinata Hyuga, Shino Aburame, Kiba Inazuka, Shikamaru Nara, Choji Akimichi, Ino Yamanaka, Suijetsu Hozuki, and Gara are born. Orochimaru flees the village. Achiha Abido fails in his attempt to capture the Ninetales, and Minato and Kushina sacrifice themselves to seal the Ninetales in Naruto. Suspicions for the Ninetales release fall on the Achiha, after which they are relocated to a reservation near Kanoha. Yahiko dies in a confrontation with Hanzo, and Nagato becomes disabled. Pain emerges. The start of the civil war in the hidden rain. Zabuza undergoes the graduation exam where he must kill his classmates. Tobi takes control of the hidden mist by hypnotizing Yugura, the fourth Mizukage, who was the Jinchuriki of the Three Tales. Ryo age 23 to 24, the second iteration of Akatsuki, Orochimaru, and Sasori. Possibly, Kakuzu joins them around this time, maybe slightly later. Ryo age 24, Itachi becomes a genius and single-handedly babysits Sasuke while his parents are somewhere unknown. Ryo age 27, Itachi becomes a Chunin. Cloud Shinobi attempt to kidnap Hinata. Niji is branded with the caged bird seal. The body of Hizashi Hyuga is sent to the hidden cloud for the sake of peace. Ryo age 29 to 30, the death of Yugura, the collapse of the bloody mist, after which peasants start exterminating all hereditary shinobi, the finest representatives of the armed forces of the mist go into hiding. Sabuza flees. Tobi and Kisame leave the hidden mist. Kisame joins Akatsuki. Ryo age 30, Itachi becomes the captain of ANBU and works as a double agent between the village leadership and the Uchiha clan. Ryo age 30 to 31, Uchiha Shursue fakes his death and gives one of his Sharingan to Itachi, asking him to protect Konoha. Itachi wipes out his own clan and joins Akatsuki. Ryo age 31, Orochimaru leaves Akatsuki after a failed attempt to obtain Itachi's Sharingan. Ryo age 34 to 35, Itachi recruits Deidara and Haiden into the organization. Ryo age 35, beginning of the first season. Ryo age 35 to 36, in the 13th or 14th year of the Civil War, Payne finally kills Hanzo Salamander, as well as all of his relatives and business partners. Akatsuki begins a full-scale hunt. The end part 1 nervously swallowing, Kanade took a deep breath and tried to calm herself down. A young Hyuga from a branch family, who had only received the title of Tokubetsu Jonin a year ago, was very anxious because in a couple of minutes she would have to enter the academy classroom and receive her first team of students. The survival of the entire team, as well as the chance for young Shinobi to have a successful career, depended on her actions as a teacher. Quickly glancing around, the Kunoichi made sure she wasn't the only one feeling nervous, as among the future leaders of the triads, more than half were precisely Tokubetsu Jonin, out of the six people in the room, only two had the rank of full Jonin. A quite obvious result of the ongoing war. Most of the strong shinobi are on the front lines or busy guarding the borders, and instead of them, they assign any suitable candidate with at least some leadership experience to train the newly graduated genin. Drumming her fingers on the armrest of the chair, Kanade lowered her gaze to the folder lying on her lap, containing the files of future shinobi and kunoichi. There was no doubt that they would all become genin, as by the order of the ANBU commander, all graduates were enrolled in the village's active forces without additional scrutiny from the teacher. However, considering the quality of education, this was not necessary, the Senju took the education of the younger generation very seriously. Opening the folder, the young Hyuga quickly glanced over the files of the trio, 
although she had practically memorized them by heart. Inazuka Tsum, the heir of the Inazuka clan head. Ishi Rotaro, a ward of the orphanage. Nara Ryo, the second heir of the ruling family of the Nara clan. Two out of three were very significant figures for the future, capable of becoming excellent allies for the Hyuga clan, and perhaps even more. The head had to strain all her connections to ensure that she was appointed as the mentor of such a promising trio. Considering that there were simply no other suitable candidates from the Hyuga, even the owner of the weakest Byakugan came in handy. Remembering a private conversation with Hokage-sama, reinforced by several unpleasant promises, Kanade shook her head, political games bring only troubles to ordinary people. And becoming a stepping stone for some supposedly brilliant teenager, for the sake of a small chance to gain him for the clan or just as a puppet, is even less pleasant. However, the alternative to such a scenario, in case of failure, is also not optimistic. Shaking her head, the Kunoichi pushed aside gloomy thoughts and focused on the papers in her hands. More precisely, on the brief description of the abilities of the trio. And if Tsum and Rotaro did not go beyond the expected list of abilities, showing a very impressive result for a fresh genin, which, however, became the norm over the last few years at the academy under the patronage of the Senju, then the third member of the team stood out significantly among his peers and caused some puzzlement, if not distrust, to what was written on the paper. And the reason for such feelings was quite simple, Nara Ryo, with some of his abilities, far surpassed his classmates, and indeed almost all the graduates who had left the academy walls over the past three years, including those who currently held the rank of Chunin. And who can believe that a 12-year-old boy in Taijutsu can compete with a full-fledged Jonin, easily defeat most Chunin, and casually knock all his classmates off their feet? Nara. Yeah, and sheep can fly. Add to this the title of third-degree genin, excellent mastery of clan taijutsu, knowledge of fuenjutsu, and a huge reserve on top of that. Not every jonin can boast such a list, and it's even harder to believe in it when such a dossier belongs to a boy who hasn't even finished the shinobi academy. Of course, Hyuga had heard about a couple of geniuses from the Nara clan, but after meeting the apathetic slacker Shikaku a couple of months ago, she began to be skeptical about such rumors. Of course, the fresh Chunin had brains, as well as potential with the ability to think strategically, but natural laziness successfully suppressed all this in most cases. And the existing photo of Ryo did not inspire much confidence, dark glasses, a mask covering half of his face, and a cloak, identical to Aburame's, didn't even allow to see his face, not to mention everything else. Which clan does he even belong to? The Kunoichi's internal reflections were interrupted by a Chunin peeking into the teacher's lounge temporarily occupied by future mentors. Your turn, you can collect your teams, announced Senju, dispelling the slightly nervous atmosphere of anticipation and promptly disappeared. Glancing at each other, the six Tokubetsu Jonin and Jonin stood up together and headed to meet their students. Following an unspoken agreement, the more experienced pair of shinobi entered the classroom first, followed by the others, carefully concealing their own excitement. Team 5, follow me, commanded Kanade, singling out the trio that had risen, and calmly walked out into the corridor. While Inazuka and Ishii perfectly matched expectations with their appearance, considering the available photographs, the Kunoichi barely managed to refrain from fitting herself into the door frame upon noticing the fully risen Nara out of the corner of her eye. The only thought that flashed through her mind was, huge! Kanade considered her 164 centimeters to be a normal average height for a Kunoichi, but this Nara not only was much broader than her but also towered almost a whole head above her. Twelve years old? Bullshit. At twelve, only Akamichi become such hulks, and not all of them, let alone the slender and delicate Naras. And especially the small square of the photograph of his head did not convey the dimensions of everything else. The short walk through the corridors to the exit gave Hyuga time to come to terms with the fact that her future student looked her age. At least part of the Taijutsu now didn't seem so unbelievable. Standing in front of the academy, the Kunoichi stepped aside and waited for the students to join her. So, team, our regular meeting place will be training ground number 53, reserved for you until you become Chunin, so the first task is to get there within 5 minutes, Kanade indifferently informed them and added, if I were you, I wouldn't relax, because even shinobi headbands don't confirm your genin status yet, I'll be the one to decide, not some simple tests at the academy. And before anyone from the trio could object, the Tokubetsu Jonin used Chunshin, leaving the gaping Jenin behind. At least, two of them, because the last one's mask concealed any grimaces. Appearing on the training ground, the Kunoichi smiled expectantly, although the order was to take them all, no one said that graduates couldn't be made to sweat a little. After all, a shinobi must be able to see through the deception and lies. 
However, Kanade was not allowed to revel in her little trick for too long. A small wind with a swirl of leaves rose nearby, heralding the end of the Shunchin, and before the surprised girl appeared Nara, holding his teammates by the scruffs like misbehaving kittens. It seems I won't have to send you back to the academy, Kanade nodded satisfactorily, instantly overcoming her surprise. Actually, for the past two years, all teams graduating from the academy are considered successful and do not undergo additional mentor checks, Ryo announced in a deep voice, releasing his comrades, this year is no different, so we already became a genin team, and your intimidation tactics are meaningless. Looking at the surprised and joyful faces of Ishii and Inazuka, Kanade felt that she was beginning to hate geniuses. TCH, spoiled all the fun. Since the Mr. Know-It-All enlightened you, then all we have left is to introduce ourselves to each other, after which I will conduct a combat skills check, restraining her irritation, the Kunoichi sat down on the ground and gestured for the students to follow suit. My name is Kanade Huga, and from this day on, I am the mentor of Team 5. I love training, spending time with friends, and taking care of flowers. I hate men who consider women weaker, rude people, and traitors. My dream is to achieve the rank of Jonin solely through my talents, without relying on Kekiai Genkai abilities, and to have a large family. Following Hyuga's gesture, Tsum continued the introduction. My name is Tsum Inazuka. I love studying clan techniques and honing my taijutsu skills, spending time with my partner Kurumaru, who is currently sick, and exploring new scents. I hate being mistaken for boys, cats, and weaklings. My ultimate dream is to prove to our entire clan the power and ability to be a leader alongside Kurumaru. Nodding, Kanade turned to Ishii. I am Ishii Rotaro. I love training in Jinjutsu and Kenjutsu, Miso Soup, and my friends. I dislike it when people mock others and arrogant individuals who personally don't accomplish anything but boast about their family's achievements as their own. My dream is to start a family and become one of the strongest shinobi. Excellent, Rotaro, now only Ryo is left, the Kunoichi smiled. My name is Ryo Nara. I love training. I dislike lazy people and those without goals. My dream is to become as powerful as the Senja brothers. My immediate goal is to surpass the students of the current Hokage by the age of 20 and become the first Nara Shinobi to achieve S rank since the founding of the village. The silence that hung over the field after the introduction of the last member of the trio could be cut with a knife. The onlookers stared at the composed genius, their jaws dropped. The first to recover was the Tokabetsu Jonin, whose brain experienced a sudden halt upon hearing that someone had appeared in the lazy clan who didn't share their penchant for rest and, moreover, loved training. Wow, excellent, now that we've gotten to know each other a bit, it's time for a little warm-up, and then some taijutsu sparring. Since I specialize mainly in hand-to-hand -hand combat and ninjutsu, that's what I'll be teaching, along with teamwork. So, I need to assess your approximate level, understand? After receiving a chorus of agreement from the trio of students, Hyuga nodded satisfactorily and sent them to do a few laps around the field. Watching the obedient Jenin run, she smirked, it seemed that being a Jonin mentor had its perks, besides a very substantial increase in income from missions. Three hours later, a tired and battered Kanade Hyuga knocked on the door of the Hokage's office and, after the ensuing invitation, entered. Tokubetsu Jonin Kanade Hyuga is ready to report on the abilities assessment of Team 5, she announced, stopping in the middle of the room and straightening up in front of the acting Hokage. Excellent, Kanade-san, the ANBU commander tore his gaze from the papers, I've read the reports from the academy, but I would like to hear your impressions from personal interaction with them. You can skip the formalities. Ishii and Inazuka hardly differ from other graduates in terms of expected skills, except that Tsum is slightly stronger than other clan members in Taijutsu, but given her parents, this is expected. As for Nara, the Kunoichi hesitated. Is he even a Nara? Without a doubt, even though it's hard to believe. His mother is Saya Nara, the clan head sister, and his father was an Uzumaki, although he died a long time ago. At least now the size and color of his hair make sense, Hyuga smirked. As for his abilities, if it weren't for some lack of experience, he could already be awarded the rank of Chunin, in Taijutsu, he is almost on par with me. And what about his other abilities? So far, the assessment has only been in close combat, but considering the approximate size of his chakra reserve, I doubt that Ryo is weak in ninjutsu, Kanade side, however, because of his strange attire, almost completely covered in seals, I couldn't accurately assess the amount of chakra in his reserves or the size of the main tenketsu, but clearly not every jonin or anbu possesses such reserves. Given his goal to become stronger than Sandame students by 20, I don't think it's unattainable. Hmm, this could pose a small problem, 
the commander frowned, leaning back in his chair, tiredly rubbing his nose. Seeing the surprised look of his subordinate, he decided to explain some things specifically about this particular genin. Let Ryo-san wish to achieve such a goal, but it is associated with a great risk of gaining the necessary experience. To do this, one must fight on the front lines, which the village's interests do not allow at the moment. This specific genin is not only a third-degree Irionin, of which there are few in Konoha at the moment, but also the only seal master supplying our forces with high-quality and reliable seals of various types. The recently opened shop belongs to him. Of course, there are other masters in the village, but the quality of their work is significantly worse, not to mention the somewhat limited range of seals produced. And that's not to mention more complex fuinjutsu patterns, such as Kekiai Genkai and Sensory Seals. Since Ryo-san is a clan shinobi, I cannot forbid him from taking on missions or working in a team, risking damaging relations with the Naras and their allies. The Hokage herself won't reward me for this, that's for sure. So, the only option left is to influence through the team mentor, who has full authority to control the difficulty of the tasks received or even focus solely on training the students. It won't work. Ishii is an orphan and needs a constant income, unlike the children from clans, the Kunoichi shook her head, mentally cursing yet another set of problems that had fallen on her head in addition to the ones she already had. Then carry out D-rank missions in the village and rare C-rank missions near Kanoha, ordered the commander, outside the walls, you will be accompanied by at least one ANBU as a backup. What about training? I don't think I can teach Nara anything new, apart from a few ninjutsu, especially considering his Suetun predisposition. Hyuga scratched her head, polishing the basics of tactics and teamwork can be done in six months or a year, but then there will only be more difficult missions. Ryo-san will also continue working at the hospital, so you will have more time to train two other students while he's away, the acting Hokage rubbed his chin thoughtfully, and then we can use his goal of becoming stronger than the Sarutobi team itself. What do you mean? Orochimaru, Tsunade, and Jiraiya are very versatile shinobi, each excelling in several disciplines. If we combine their abilities, our ambitious genin will need good teachers in ninjutsu, jinjutsu, taijutsu, kenjutsu, and everything else. So, if you can't provide them, you'll ask for a favor from some friends, whose selection I'll take care of myself. And what's the point? Keeping Nara in the village for long won't work, all he needs to do is complain to his uncle or grandfather, and there will immediately be cries of infringement of rights at the council, the kunoichi sarcastically snorted, showing her attitude towards clan politics. Perhaps, but during his training, my students will be able to instill survival skills in Ryo's head and perhaps even make him realize the value of his hide for the village, as well as the need for tactical retreat in case of an unfavorable situation. After all, it's better to have a living medical nin and few injutsu master than a mission completed at the cost of his death. For a year or two, we'll keep him from anything too serious and dangerous, and then the situation will calm down, and the Hokage will return, relieving me of this extra headache. So stick to the chosen line and don't expose the team to unnecessary risks, and report on our genius's progress every month. I won't keep you any longer. Understood. Bowing, Hyuga hastily left the office, and only after closing the door behind her did she breathe a sigh of relief, the commander literally overwhelmed her with his personality and strength, and his casual tone made her quite nervous. She was more accustomed to receiving clear instructions from superiors than just chatting. And if they condescended to her and even patiently explained things, then the situation with Ryo Nara was indeed serious, and it was better to stick to the planned training regimen, almost without being distracted by missions. It's not entirely clear how to carry out the order from Hokage-sama, but the increased attention of the ANBU to the goal doesn't bode well for her primarily. However, it's best to start making plans only after the goal becomes somewhat familiar. She had no intention of hanging on someone's neck at the first opportunity and enticing with her charms, as some silly girls in the academy tried to do, and rumors even reached her. Hyuga was not going to do that, and she was too proud of her accomplishments for such cheap tactics. It's better to act quietly, steadily, and reliably, gradually changing Ryo's status from a reliable teacher to a close friend, and then perhaps even to a lover, if not a wife. There's time to spare. A bit battered and tired, but very satisfied, I leisurely walked home, reflecting on the mentor I had today. Considering her quite young age, her taijutsu skills are very good, and Kanade herself is experienced enough to defeat me purely in hand-to-hand -hand combat. However, here I'm being a bit deceitful, with seals disabled and muscles fueled by chakra, I could easily overpower her almost effortlessly just with speed, not to mention strength. 
My cloak played its role in today's training too, reliably concealing all Tenketsu from the Byakugan's view and serving as an obstacle for the opponent's chakra. However, considering Kanade's demonstrated modified soft fist style, her eyes aren't capable of distinguishing most Tenketsu, and instead, strikes of concentrated chakra are usually directed at vital points on the body. Considering my control, chakra density, and knowledge of human anatomy, I can easily take advantage of it for myself, but the soft fist style, used by the most experienced combatants, provides much greater scope for inflicting damage to the opponent. If the mentor's ninjutsu is on a similar level, then it becomes clear why she holds such a high rank at her age. Usually, tokubetsu jonin are promoted after 18 or 19, like Ma. Getting a promotion at 16, even during wartime, is a very solid achievement that commands respect. At least, I'm satisfied with the assembled team, even despite Tsum's presence, with whom relations didn't start off well from the beginning. After some time and a dozen or so brutal beatings, in which I wiped the floor with her almost without any problems, Inazuka and her pack reluctantly acknowledged my leadership, and our relationship settled at the level of armed neutrality with a drop of respect. I didn't have anything against Ishii before, even sometimes helping the guy with advice, so considering the tactics drilled into us at the academy and the habit of acting in teams, we got quite a balanced cell capable of working both at close and long distances. And the fact that they attached a woman to us greatly pleased me, Kanade's figure turned out to be beyond praise, as well as her almost third size bust. But most importantly, she didn't try to cling to me and annoy me, which was so irritating in the academy. Thank all the demons in the world that I foresaw attempts to ensnare me through simple seduction and managed to disguise myself, it's very difficult to track the reaction of a bundled up person whose face and eyes aren't visible. However, a couple of times I caught the mentor giving me overly assessing glances, but what they were related to, time will tell. For now, I should hurry home and inform Saya about the composition of my team, have a snack, and drop by Mito's place, at yesterday's celebration of becoming a genin, she asked me to come over to discuss something. I hope it's not a taijutsu training. Remembering the first sparring session with a fully recovered Uzumaki, I shivered. 32 seconds. That's how much time Mito needed to completely defeat me in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The result was 26 fractures and numerous bruises. Yeah, my relative doesn't like to hold back or know how to. Never before in my life had I been leveled to the ground like that. Considering that even most jonin had a hard time grappling with me by that time, you can assess the power of the first Hokage's wife. It was after this incident that I started seriously strengthening my bones and muscles with medical techniques. At the moment, my personal record for the duration of a spar against Mido is 5 minutes 32 seconds, which is quite good against an Srank Kunoichi. Maybe in 3 or 4 years, I'll be able to fight her on equal terms in Taijutsu. In any case, I'll put all my efforts into it. Nodding friendly to the guard at the quarter gate, who congratulated me on receiving the Hitai 8, I headed home. Kachan, I'm home, pushing open the front door with a shout, I was quite surprised to see an extra pair of shoes in the hallway. We're here, Ryo Kuen, Saya's voice came from the living room. Shrugging, I kicked off my sandals and headed to the living room, where Ma and three guests were present. I've only managed to half learn to use my sensory abilities constantly, but accurately determining the ownership of detected chakra sources was still beyond me. The exception was only Uzumaki and Senju for obvious reasons. But the trio felt somewhat familiar. Stepping over the threshold, I found that in addition to my uncle and his wife, Grandpa was also there and all four were extremely serious. And Ma seemed annoyed too. What's the occasion for the family gathering? I raised an eyebrow, pausing. A quick glance at the adults and the excessive tension hanging in the air made me wary. It seemed they were about to delight me with some not very pleasant news, and I could guess a couple of options right away. Damn. Hello, Ryo Kuen, the clan head finally spoke, let me once again congratulate you on becoming a genin. And in connection with this, as well as your legal adulthood, we need to discuss a few things directly related to you and your position in the clan, Setsura added. If necessary, we'll discuss it, I shrugged, dispelling the disguise and walked to the couch, plopping down next to Ma, so, what's up? We're going to talk about your marriage, or rather, about marriage proposals received on your behalf from various interested parties, Grandpa Isher stated directly, ignoring Saya scowling. Before I could even open my mouth to object, my aunt interrupted me. Nothing is decided yet, and you'll only have to get married around 16 to 18, so there's time to think. We gathered today just to inform you and hear your opinion, she said. My opinion? The mischievous prankster lurking deep in my soul woke up and actively began demanding to have some fun at someone else's expense. Well, I don't know, why settle for one when there could be many? 
And what about the trophies then? Trophies? All four Naras exclaimed almost synchronously. Well, yeah, trophies, I continued as if not noticing the general surprise, after all, it's better to bring home a defeated Kunoichi yourself than deal with one imposed as an alliance treaty. After my explanation, the surprise on their faces turned into entirely different emotions. The clan head simply dropped his jaw as if he had been told that the Sage of the Six Paths had been resurrected and was seeking to join the family. Grandpa refrained from showing emotional outbursts due to years of experience, but a spark of pride and amusement could be seen deep in his eyes. And the present women did not appreciate my idea judging by their clenched fists and gritted teeth. Especially Saya, who seemed to be putting extra effort into it. MMM, tell me, Ryo, where did you get such an idea? Setsura asked, sweetly smiling, ignoring the men who were retreating. Ignoring my own instincts, I decided to finish the presentation anyway and with an expression of innocence on my face, I casually shrugged. Well, you see, we've recently practiced such tactics, and besides, Grandpa married Akunoichi just like that in the end, and Nara Yagami grabbed himself for that way. Yagami? While everyone was racking their brains, trying to remember the shinobi from the clan with that name, I printed out the memoirs and threw them on the table. This is Nara Yagami. Saya was the first to grab the book, feverishly flipping through the pages and getting paler with each passing second. Oops. Looks like she's in shock. Saya Chen? Getting up from my seat, I leaned on the armrest next to her. And if Shinetsu radiated pure bewilderment at the sight of the book, then in Grandpa's eyes, recognition first appeared, then caution, and he, taking advantage of the general confusion, began to slowly retreat to the exit. Ryo Kuen, tell me, when did you get this book, and where did you get it? Setsura suddenly asked, suspiciously squinting. Hmm, I found it behind one of the shelves in the library, I said, rubbing my chin demonstratively, inwardly smiling, and I was about three at the time. You could say these memoirs became my bedside book, and Shikaku and company liked it too. The horrified faces of the women became excellent entertainment for me, at least until they opened their mouths. Three years? Shikaku? Two piercing cries above my ear stunned me, but I noticed Grandpa hiding his face in his hands. And in the next moment, two pairs of hands started shaking me. You let Shika read this? Forget everything written there. Immediately. It's not hard to guess who those words belong to. Well, yeah, what's the big deal? I feigned bewilderment. At least now it's clear where Shikaku got such ideas from, chuckled the clan head, picking up and examining the discarded book, much to the chagrin of the women. Saya-chan, where were you looking when raising the child? Aunt sighed heavily as she sank onto the couch, giving up trying to shake me. All right, let's go to the Yamanakas urgently and have them weed out these absurd ideas from your head. Ma proclaimed with a maniacal gleam in her eyes, attempting to drag me along. Considering the size difference, it was a comical sight, especially when she almost succeeded. With a sigh, I untangled Ma's hands from my shirt, swiftly immobilizing her and seating her next to me, firmly secured. It was still amusing, but it was starting to get a little tiresome. Calm down, Kachan, no need for any Yamanakas, and besides, you should be glad I didn't turn into a second Jiraiya, with all those attempts to rope me in at the academy. The boys got a point, so stop freaking out, uncle chimed in, throwing nervous glances at the women, you should worry more about why such things are lying around in the clan library where children can find them. Who leaves such biographies freely accessible anyway, asked Saya, as angry as a demon, giving up her futile attempts to break free from my grasp. Well, judging by the fact that Tasan made a clean getaway, he's somehow responsible, Shinetsu shrugged, relieved to shift the blame. When I get my hands on him, I'll wring that old bastard's neck. Setsura cracked her knuckles menacingly. That can wait, let's get back to the more pressing issue, sighed Nara, as troublesome as it may be, you can't avoid marriage, Ryo, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on the matter. Suspiciously eyeing the frozen Saya, I loosened my grip and scratched my chin thoughtfully. Honestly, I hadn't even considered this question yet, although I did acknowledge the high probability of an arranged marriage. So, I understand that a potential candidate for my wife will come from the clan? Undoubtedly, no one intends to give you away for just any alliance, scoffed Setsura, they want too much. Which clans are trying to push their candidates? I continued to clarify the situation, ignoring Ma's suspicious glance. Yeah, as if I didn't know about the pile of junk mail that ends up in our mailbox. Hyuga, Achiha, Inazuka, several merchant clans in the village, and even our allies have hinted at their desire to intermarry through you, uncle listed. But the first two can be dismissed, as they want you in their clan and certainly don't intend to relinquish control over their dojitsu. Which way are you leaning? Of course, towards Yamanaka and Akamichi, or at worst, 
We should pick someone from our own clan to avoid being pestered too much about it, Shinetsu shook his head. In general, if it's not the Akamichi, I don't really care, I stated plainly, my main requirements are no marriage until 18, a good figure, and a docile character in the girl, the rest you can figure out yourselves. Of course, if there are several candidates, the final decision is mine. Understood, I'll take your wishes into account, and as soon as a decision is made, you'll be the first to know. Deal. As soon as this important matter was settled, the clan head and his wife hurried to leave, eager to get out of reach of Saya's piercing gaze, which clearly didn't like any of this. You shouldn't have agreed, Ma sighed after a long silence, I married your father for love, despite a similar situation. I doubt I'll be given a choice, too many are interested in acquiring my abilities one way or another, I sighed. Anyway, all the rest aside, masters of Iriyajitsu and Fuinjutsu don't just come knocking, especially not now. Still, I really don't want to endure some puppet at home for the sake of silly clan relations. Ma pouted, crossing her arms over her chest. There, there, no need to be jealous, I smirked, embracing her shoulders and pulling her closer, planting a kiss on her forehead. I love you more than anyone in the world. I'm not jealous, I'm concerned about your family happiness. Yeah, yeah, I believe you. Ryo. As amusing as it was to tease Saya, I still needed to talk to Mito, so I had to end the fun. After explaining the situation to Ma about the team, I kissed her on the cheek and hurried to the Senju Quarter. Thanks to extensive practice with Shunshin over the past few months, I reached my destination in just a few minutes. Nodding to the quarter's guards, I hastened to the Uzumaki women's house. Since Kushina was still at the academy, the training ground was empty, and Mito was probably at home. Climbing the steps, I rang the doorbell and leaned against the wall. Today had been eventful, and I wanted to sort out all my affairs quickly to get a good night's sleep. However, I didn't have to wait long, literally a few seconds later, the door swung open, revealing the elder Uzumaki in her casual kimono. Kumein, Ryokun. Slipping off my sandals, I followed the hostess, noticing a slightly tense look and a very serious expression on Mito's face. Damn, did they all conspire together? Nevertheless, the serious conversation only began after the hostess, according to all the rules, prepared tea, and we enjoyed some homemade cookies. Ryo Kuen, yesterday you became a genin and according to the village laws, you became an adult. Our clan also follows a similar tradition, so from this day on, I can start your kenjutsu training, Mito began. Hearing such news, I couldn't help but grin widely, finally, I would have a proper teacher instead of scrolls. From the very beginning of our joint taijutsu training, I wanted to learn the way of the sword from her. After all, if I were to go to anyone for apprenticeship, it would be to the best, and in Kanoha, that was Mito, overshadowing even the acknowledged genius Sakumo Hataki. Well, he was considered the best, but with the return of youth, that title returned to the Uzumaki. Of course, nobody was notified about this, but seeing the sword dance performed by the red-haired Kunoichi a couple of times, I was captivated, not only by her skill but also by the performer. Considering that in the clan of redheads, true training in swordsmanship only begins after completing the academy and receiving the Hitai 8, I had to be patient. But that's only one of the reasons I called you to me, Mito continued, smiling at my enthusiastic expression. Now that you've come of age, it's time for you to learn a little more about us and our secrets. What do you mean? You'll find out soon, but for now, we need to take a little walk, Uzumaki said mysteriously, rising from the table. Puzzled, I followed her. We didn't leave the Senju quarter, but the clan houses were left behind, and Mito led me into the depths of a large park, which Hashirama had planted. Judging by the almost overgrown path underfoot, it was clear that not many people walked in this part. After about ten minutes of leisurely walking, the Kunoichi stopped at the edge of a small clearing and reached out, touching a barely perceptible barrier that didn't emit any chakra and was completely undetectable at a distance of several steps even for my sensory abilities. Before I could ask about it, the empty space suddenly began to ripple, and the illusion dissipated, revealing an old but still decently maintained shrine. The building didn't look like a temple at all. Without a word, Mito gestured for me to follow her inside. Following her, I found myself in a spacious room, the far wall behind the altar of which was adorned with numerous masks, typically depicting Shinigami. Damn, there was such an episode in the manga when Oryx stole a mask from here. Welcome to Uzumaki Ikazoku no Nomendo. The Uzumaki clan's mask house? Original. Hmm, so, our masked orgies held here, I joked and immediately received a slap on the back of my head. We'll talk about orgies later, Uzumaki menacingly promised, and with an irritated sigh, continued, but now it's time for history. Before you stands the shrine of the Shinigami. Yeah, got it. 
Our clan has revered the god of death for centuries, and even some of our few Injutsu is tied to his summons. And I need to know this because? As the only Uzumaki in Konoha besides me and Kushina, you have the right to know. Plus, one of these masks is a powerful artifact and requires constant supervision behind the protective barrier in case I'm absent for a long time. And will you tell Kushichan too? I asked, inspecting the masks and trying to determine which one was genuine. No, she's too trusting, hot-tempered, and can't keep her tongue in check, the Kunoichi frowned, shaking her head, and such an artifact can cause a lot of harm in the wrong hands. Then why not just seal the mask away, hiding it among other important items? It won't work, once the artifact is taken out of the shrine, a good sensor can easily detect it even behind the most reliable barriers, and sealing it into a scroll won't work, she explained. In this place, the aura of the Shinigami's power is neutralized, and the mask looks like a simple wooden item among many others. I see. What do you need from me? A drop of blood infused with your chakra, Mito responded, approaching the far pillar of the shrine and revealing the binding seal with a single touch. Shrugging, I drew out a kunai and provided what was needed. The binding and obtaining the key seal weren't particularly difficult, so after a few minutes, I felt the entire space both inside and outside the shrine up to the established barrier. Considering the almost complete suppression of my sensory abilities inside, this was a good defense job. Now you'll always know if someone tries to break in here, Mito nodded satisfactorily. There was nothing more to do in the shrine, and we headed back. Walking leisurely along the path, I pondered the fickleness of fate. In a normal course of events, about two decades in the future, this shrine would have been abandoned, and the powerful artifact would have simply gathered dust on the wall, like all the Senju clan's possessions. Of course, until Orochimaru took it for himself. At present, that snake would barely know about the existence of such a mask, let alone appear on the clan's territory, and I became the next guardian. Ha, huh, if Minato knew about the possibility of using a sealing jutsu on a tailed beast without any consequences, he would have gladly given his right arm to use the mask. However, I'm not going to share such information with anyone else, including Kushina, as sad as it may be. If I have to seal away the tailed beast, having such a trump card up my sleeve will come in handy. And that's just one artifact. How many more are stored in Yuzushiogakure, it's hard to imagine. Another confirmation of the coolness of the red-haired Fuinjutsu masters. I wonder if anyone besides them is capable of creating something similar to the Shinigami mask using seals? I doubt it. How's the technique training going? I asked Mito, emerging from my thoughts. A few months ago, I presented the new way of using our Kekiai Genkai to the elder Uzumaki, greatly surprising and impressing her. However, the second feeling was not towards the chakra chains themselves but rather towards the simple barrier that I created around myself literally in split seconds using them. I decided to demonstrate the overwhelming properties on a live target, releasing a couple of salty jokes about the spiny Mito. For which I suffered later. However, it was worth it. A scroll with detailed instructions was also sent to our ancestor in Yuzushiogakure at my insistence. The first time I saw a summoned animal live. A very disgruntled summoned animal, to be more precise. Right now I only have one attempt out of five, but in the next few months, I'll finally master the hand seals for energy separation right at the source, sighed Mito. After so many years of chakra use, it's very difficult to overcome my own reflexes. And what about Kushinachan? She's almost there, she replied with obvious pride. Of course, with her increasing volume, her control is worse than mine, but she's not set in her ways yet, she learns everything new very quickly. Fair enough. Allowing the red-haired couple the opportunity to learn my secret, I took an oath not to tell anyone about the source of such knowledge and especially about the principles of operation, deterring overly curious minds with a story about the side effects of our chakra density. After already being labeled a genius by those around me, I didn't seek to further confirm it. If you think about it, it's the Uzumaki women, ma and uncle's family, who treat me normally, not emphasizing my uniqueness. The others prefer to notice my achievements rather than me as a simple person. Even in the academy, among rowdy peers who didn't recognize authority, this attitude persisted, albeit in a somewhat truncated form. By the way, today I was blessed with the news that the clan has already started looking for a suitable bride, I told Mito, breaking the brief silence. It was to be expected, shrugged Uzumaki. Elder heirs usually marry strong non-clan Kunoichi to exclude even the slightest possibility of influence from other clans, but brothers and sisters, both native and cousins, await marriages calculated to strengthen old alliances or create new ones. The infusion of fresh strong blood goes without saying. What did you answer to that? No marriage until 18, and otherwise I don't care, I shrugged. 
Can't avoid it anyway, so might as well postpone it, and a lot can happen in six years. Maybe I'll find my chosen one before then? Although, considering that I've never truly fallen in love even in my past life, let alone this one, being too cold-blooded and rational by nature, this scenario is unlikely. Sympathy, yes. I can offer Kushchan's hand as one of the options, Mito sighed. You just need to insist on her candidacy, and the problem is solved. You'll give her to me? I raised an eyebrow questioningly. Well, you're a smart boy, and you could have figured it out long ago, she smirked. If you're talking about that hidden scroll from Ma, I figured it out a long time ago, I smirked back. Besides, it's better you than some idiot from the clan, shrugged the Kunoichi. At least I know you won't harm her and will cherish and protect her in every way. A very tempting offer, but no, I replied seriously, pushing aside a branch and stepping out onto a well-kept park path. At least, not right now. May I know the reason for your refusal, asked Mito, following suit and linking her arm through the one I offered. First and foremost, because of her age, she's still too young for such decisions, and besides, do I need to remind you of your own words regarding the Jinchuriki? I raised my eyebrows. A lot can change in six years, and I don't want to be an obstacle to Kushinachan's happiness. If she loves me by then, great. If not, I'll make sure her chosen one is a worthy person, not just another scumbag chasing the status of a Jinchuriki's husband. With such support, it's much easier to climb to the top of power in Kanoha. Heh, yeah, let's make Minato's task more difficult, if not impossible. But the attention of the four old fogies is not necessary for me at the moment, and marrying a Jinchuriki would be too strong a move. They might try to eliminate her. After explaining my position, I received a strange look from Mito. Unabashed pride mixed with something else. Alright, I won't try to force you two together, even though this option suits me much more than all the others, but still, hold on to the scroll, maybe it'll come in handy in the future. Naturally, besides, even if I marry by clan decision, no one's stopping me from having mistresses, after all, given my Uzumaki stamina and Irionin skills, one wife would obviously not be enough, even if she's a jonin, let alone everyone else. Did you find out from experience? Mito squinted slyly. Oops. Under my companion's gaze, I barely prevented the blood from rushing to my face. Damn, it's awesome to be a savvy medic. Except that the amused sparkle in my companion's eyes showed the futility of my efforts. Slouching, I sighed and admitted my defeat, I couldn't compete with the elder Uzumaki, who had years of experience in reading people. Oh ho ho, Ryokuen has learned the joys of carnal pleasures, Mito smirked victoriously, and who was the lucky girl who was able to ride you? Saddle me? Yeah, right. I jumped up, but immediately deflated when I realized I'd fallen for her trick. It's just a mutually beneficial agreement until I get the Hittite E era, and I was beginning to think that some overdeveloped little brat from the academy was able to get you, the Kunoichi raised an eyebrow and answered my questioning gaze. The earth is full of rumors, you know. Given the possibility of this development, I took measures in advance and found a way to release excessive tension, no feelings, a simple calculation on both sides, I explained, indignantly snorted. There's no point in trying to hide from Mito anyway, she can read me like an open book simply because of her experience, not to mention her ability to track negative emotions and sensorics. So who's the lucky girl? A regular non-clan jonin. Anyway, our contract ended yesterday, so now we'll have to visit a brothel, I shrugged. It's strange, but talking to Mito about this sort of thing doesn't make me feel embarrassed, as if I were talking to an old friend about women. It's weird. Even with Ma, I wouldn't talk to her like that, even though I trust her completely. A whorehouse? E.W. My companion frowned. Why don't you just get a steady girlfriend on the side? And give yourself some leverage? Especially if she turns out to be from the clans or planted by interested parties. No, thank you. Oh ho, so you're completely free now? Maybe I should remember my youth and show what real Uzumaki women are capable of? Mito suddenly asked in a playful and very sensual voice, pressing herself tighter against my arm and letting me feel her breasts hidden by the thin layer of fabric. A wave of heat rushed through my body, and I felt weak in the knees for a moment. When I looked into the Kunoichi's eyes, I realized she wasn't kidding. Hell, just the thought of being in bed with Mito was like a red rag to a bowl. I don't care about her age, for red-haired masters of Fuenjutsu it's not important, the main thing is that any man would sacrifice one hand for the opportunity to get such a woman. Besides, it's ridiculous for me to bring up age, at the time of my death, I looked far worse than she did before rejuvenation. Hmm, I guess that's a yes, Mito grinned, her gaze lowering to a specific part of my anatomy that reacted accordingly. I'd like to see an idiot decide to say no to a proposal like that, I shook my head, smiling. 
I looked around to make sure there were no witnesses, and then I turned around and hugged Mito to my tempting lips. Hey, strike while the iron is hot. After a couple of minutes and catching my breath, I cast a questioning glance at my companion. And you don't waste time, Uzumaki licked her lips. You can blame yourself and your beauty for that, I answered her and resumed the interrupted activity to mutual pleasure. After a dozen minutes of self-indulgent kissing, I sensed a couple of chakra sources approaching, and decided to move our communication to a more private place. I pulled away, and in a single motion, I picked up Mito in my arms and used the shunshin to carry us to the edge of the barrier around her house. Once we were through it and sure that Kushina wasn't around, I headed for the entrance, but someone seemed a little bored with the simple plight of cargo and the heated kissing resumed. I came to my senses in the spacious bedroom, practically lying on top of Mito, one hand on her waist and the other massaging her firm buttocks through the fabric of the kimono. Okay, stop. Pulling back a little, I took a breath. Hmm? First we'll create a clone each and put a barrier on the room, I explained at the red-haired beauty's questioning look. Yours will meet Kushina, and mine will go home to act as a presence, since I won't be leaving here today. That's right, we don't want Kushichan to catch us at the most important moment, Mito nodded in agreement. After creating a clone each, we sent them off to do their jobs, and returned to the task at hand, putting on the sound-blocking kekai and locking the door. Pulling the kimono off the beautiful Uzumaki's shoulders and gulping at the sight of her triumphantly heaving firm size three breasts without any underwear on, all I could think was that even a full day might not be enough. And then there was no time to think. Waking up the next morning, I just lay there staring dumbly at the ceiling, listening to the measured breathing of Mito sleeping on top of me. My head was empty, empty, and I didn't feel like thinking at all. Yeah, that was quite a night. Or rather, the rest of the day and night. Suffice it to say, I was drained dry of all the energy I had, and by the end of it, neither Uzumaki's stamina nor Irionin's skills were helping. No way. I bet my former partner would have passed out long ago. I gazed out the window at the sky that was just beginning to lighten, then gently ran my hand through the luxurious red hair that swept down Mito's back and sighed contentedly. Even the first time in this life wasn't as gorgeous as the time spent with the elder Uzumaki. I don't think I'll even glance in the direction of other women in the coming week. But if this is the usual stamina of the fairer sex of the Fuinjutsu Master Clan, I dread to imagine what kind of monster in bed Kushina will grow into. Even a team of ordinary men wouldn't be able to handle it. That kind of thought made me laugh. But jokes aside, if I get Kushichan as well, I'll hardly have any strength left for other candidates for mistress. No, 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 I'm not going to stop at just two or three women. After all, life is so short and dangerous among shinobi, and there are so many beautiful, shapely, graceful and so deadly seductive kunoichi around. Ordinary women are a poor comparison. However, time will tell. When I felt movement, I snapped out of my musings and lowered my gaze to find Mito awake. More like awake, more like in a half slumber. As I continued to stroke her hair, I smiled broadly. Good morning. Morning, she yawned charmingly, stretching and crunching her joints. Feeling the beauty of her naked body moving on me, and especially the sight of her firm breasts before my eyes, I suddenly realized that several hours of rest had done their job and the continuation of the banquet would not be long in coming. Era, you're not the only one awake, Mito grinned suddenly, her belly clearly feeling my arousal. Exactly, and we have at least two hours to spare, I answered, and in one movement I was on top of her. And why do I feel like you planned this a long time ago? I asked, resting from such a pleasant activity and going through the strands of silky hair of the beauty who was nestled on the side. Probably because it's true, Mito answered me with a mocking amazement. Em? I raised an eyebrow questioningly. As if there were no other candidates? Given my situation, there really aren't, and hardly anyone on the small list of suitable candidates has your stamina, the Kunoichi snorted. And given the situation in the village, you're the perfect choice, and the one I'm most sympathetic to. She playfully patted me on the head. But waiting for me to grow up for a couple of years, seems like too long, I doubted. Considering that after Hashikuen, I had no one, this hardly seems like a serious period. Besides, knowing you for so long, I can be sure there are no ulterior motives in our relationship, even if it's purely friendly. I can always sense feelings towards myself. Motives? Do you think why Tsunade is still without a husband, even though she's well past her twenties? It's because the vast majority of men courting her are after money, influence, and senju fame, not her herself. Others just want to possess such a luxurious body. It's almost the same situation with me now, especially with the possibility of influencing Kushinachan through me. Hiruzen and Danzo are boiling with desire to get her in their hands. Well, I need you yourself, I chuckled and pulled Mito closer, kissing her with pleasure.
MMM, I feel like I'm 20 again, she murmured after a while, pulling back slightly. Hey, and I feel like I'm 13. Ha ha ha. You could say that in real age, we're not that different. Alright, maybe we should get up, otherwise Kushinachan will stay hungry, and I'll be late for the team meeting, I glanced at the clock and sighed somewhat disappointedly, got out of bed, not at all embarrassed by my own nudity, and began picking up the clothes scattered on the floor. Indeed, I had to abandon the idea of putting it on again, the smell had soaked too deeply into the fabric in the bedroom, and Tsum would sniff me out in a second. Yes, we really need to get up, I still have a lot to do today, agreed Uzumaki. Watching her struggle to get out of bed, I couldn't help but smile proudly. However, her heavy gaze quickly erased it, and I hurried to apply my medical ninjutsu skills, allowing Mido to walk almost normally. After a quick joint shower, which lasted another half hour, I unpacked a spare set of clothes, quickly put it on, and slipped out of the house with a farewell kiss before Kushina could discover my presence. Fortunately, my clone was already waiting for me in the crown of a nearby tree and dispersed as soon as I came into view. Only after receiving a stream of information did I remember with horror in what state I had created it. Feverishly sorting through memories, I barely managed to hold back a relieved sigh, although the idea of Kagetsu Bunshin in my head was filled to the brim with indecent thoughts and scenes involving Sai, I had enough sense not to try to make them a reality. Suffice it to say, meditation rules. Then, my empty stomach reminded me with a loud roar, and I realized that I had missed even yesterday's lunch, not to mention dinner and breakfast, so I had to have a good meal before heading to the training ground to replenish my strength. Considering that Ichiraku was practically on the way, I happily turned there and slurped down seven plates of various ramen one after another. After belching contentedly, I continued on my way. There were still about 20 minutes left until 9 o'clock, and rushing didn't make sense. Hey, Ryo, good morning. As I was leaving the residential quarters, someone called out to me. Hey, good, I nodded to Ishii, waiting for him, and continued to walk leisurely along the road. A couple of minutes passed in silence until my partner decided to break it. How do you like our mentor? Not bad, despite the title of Tokubetsu Jonin, she's quite competent in Taijutsu. If everything else is on the same level, we've got ourselves a decent teacher, I shrugged. Not to mention her figure, the guy grinned. Can't deny that, but better not spread rumors, the Hugas are very particular and have almost nothing to catch on with outsiders, I warned him. That's true, but no one will forbid looking. Indeed, I agreed. By the way, I've been meaning to ask, why do you dress so conservatively? I understand Aburaim, but you're a Nara. Well, the goggles protect my eyes from dust and any flashes, the mask filters the air from harmful impurities and most volatile poisons, and the cloak serves as additional protection, partially concealing my chakra, preventing reading movements in taijutsu and masking any existing weapons. Naturally, most conditions are achieved through few and applied to them. Not to mention the almost complete impossibility of reading me through my eyes, face, or involuntary body movements, which are famous for Hyuga and Uchiha. Even quite seasoned shinobi possess such an ability. And how much do these things cost? Rotaro was interested. I have no idea, I made them myself, but it took a lot of time to process the items and apply the seals, so it's a custom job. I see. That's what I like about this guy, he didn't beg to have the same done for him, as many would have done in his place. The last of our trio was already at the training ground when we approached, so after greeting her, we waited together for Kanade. However, she appeared via Shunshin just a couple of minutes later, arriving exactly at 9. Good morning, everyone. Without further ado, start stretching while I outline our daily schedule for the next few months, Hugo rushed in, not waiting for our response. Shrugging, I began performing the usual routine adopted in the academy before the day's first physical exercises. My example was followed by my teammates. So, in the morning, we'll focus on your physical condition and endurance, running, squats, push-ups, and the like without using chakra, the instructor began listing, pacing around us. Then a few minutes of rest and taijutsu practice, since it's the most important discipline for your survival. What's the point of knowing a bunch of techniques if you can't apply them effectively? Of course, each of you will work on your own style, but I will point out any mistakes and correct them. Looks like I'll have to enhance the level of training seals a bit more to feel the results. So, can I only use clan style? Tsum asked. Exactly, I'm very familiar with it, as well as most other styles, except perhaps those used by Ryukuen, Hyuga nodded proudly. After three hours, there will be lunch, followed by at least one D-rank mission. Depending on your diligence and speed, you should be home by around five. 
What about the other aspects of improving Shinobi? Ishii asked, fully warmed up. Since none of you will be released from the village for the first six months, we will gradually work on all your abilities, focusing primarily on physical capabilities and taijutsu. When I decide that you are at the level of a normal chunin, we will move on to another aspect. But three hours of physical training will always be a given, understood? Yes. In that case, we're running 50 laps around the polygons now to boost your endurance, then we'll start the exercises, Kanade nodded and, setting a good example, took off from a standing position. Everyone, follow me. Considering the fact that she didn't slow down for a moment, periodically watching with Byakugan to ensure no one cheated using Chakra, by the end of the first hour and the final lap, half the team arrived noticeably out of breath and sweating. Such a distance posed no difficulty for me, even with an increased load of seals, so I just grinned at two envious looks and one approving glance, not that it could be noticed, and shrugged. Then followed numerous exercises to develop strength, speed, agility, and mobility, where I had to sweat a lot primarily because a few hours of sleep weren't enough for proper recovery. But judging by the condition of my teammates, I still looked pretty good by noon, while this couple was clearly on their last legs. Of course, the intensity of the training is slightly below my usual, but Hyuga shouldn't expect ordinary students to have Uzumaki's endurance, despite all the training received in the academy. At least we can be sure that in six months, everyone in the team will be in good enough physical shape for Chunin. The subsequent Taijutsu training session was almost identical to yesterday's, except this time we fought not only with the instructor but also with each other, where she pointed out various mistakes and ways to overcome them. Specifically, this applied only to Rotaro and Tsum, as Mito had polished my stances, strikes, and movements much better than academy instructors. The only thing I lacked a bit to defeat Kanade with current restrictions was experience. Decent strength and speed were there even with working seals. To wrap up the day, we had a D-rank mission where we were forced to weed a garden. Nothing unexpected for me, but it was pleasant to see the expressions on the faces of the others. I intentionally didn't warn them. By the way, unlike Shikaku and his group, we received the assignment from a regular clerk in the lower floors of the Hokage Tower, not directly from the Hokage himself or his deputy, who currently occupied the office. Here we see the division between privileged and ordinary shinobi, even if they are from a clan. I am not an heir, though I stand second in line, Ishii is an orphan from a shelter, and the Inazuka is merely the wife of the clan head, so they won't go out of their way to court us. At least beyond a certain limit, Kanade herself chose a mission from the available scrolls rather than being handed a pre-selected one, like a couple of teams who received missions with us. From what I understand, the Hokage personally assigns missions to clan heirs first and foremost to avoid risky missions that could provoke clan claims. Also, personal acquaintance and assessment of future leaders play a role. Politics, damn it, it's unavoidable. I'm willing to bet that when Kushina's turn comes, her team will exclusively receive missions directly from the Hokage, and Hiruzen will pretend to be a kindly uncle, aiming to leave only a positive impression. Engrossed in training and other activities, the days flew by in an instant, forming weeks, and weeks gradually turned into months without any notable shocks. Routine teamwork and improving individual skills became Kanade's main focus of education. Having more or less achieved a normal physical shape and speed for a chunin, and significantly improved my teammates' taijutsu, young Hyuga shifted to chakra control and ninjutsu. It was here that she really unfolded, literally overwhelming Tsum, who was focused on hand-to-hand -hand combat, and Rotaro, who was more accustomed to swords. A vivid demonstration of when a close combat shinobi simply can't reach their target in time. The first stage of training immediately became clear, without acquired speed, agility, dexterity, and endurance, this pair wouldn't stand a chance against destructive katan techniques. Considering our instructor also mastered Dotan, I was the only one with decent odds, thanks to Suetun proficiency and clan Hijitsu. However, as often happened in Taijutsu, I simply lacked the experience against an opponent who knew their capabilities well and how to apply them. And my arsenal of three water techniques was clearly insufficient against the almost dozen unleashed against me. Here, it wasn't just about the forced restrictions. Well, they were in place but didn't affect the outcome as much as in Taijutsu. Unfortunately, considering my equipment's capabilities, overall damage resistance, and sensor skills, Kanade preferred not to hold back. My enormous reserve was the only thing that saved me, Huga simply tired out faster than she could truly harm me. I understood she took advantage of the opportunity and used me to conduct full-scale training sessions on herself. I involuntarily had to study new Suetun techniques and resume working on Raitun, which had been neglected recently due to an overload of tasks. 
I completed the first part of elemental training, gaining the ability to use Chidori and its variations through some control over the element, but overall power still left much to be desired. Working at the hospital and frequent off-hours calls did not help in this matter. A huge relief amid the insane schedule became the not-so-frequent meetings with the elusive Mido and rare visits from Reiko. A month after receiving the Genin title, we had a serious conversation with the latter, after which she definitively transitioned into friends with benefits. However, subconsciously, this is roughly what I expected, after more than a year of communicating with a nice person and getting to know each other well, it's hard to break the bonds that have formed. But all of this was merely background to the true goal, almost completely overtaking my mind, studying the possibilities of Yin Chakra and preparing for my first major intervention in history personally, not through others by means of well-chosen words. And let's not forget about the existing benefits. Considering the fairly imminent end of the Second Shinobi World War, the overall weakening of the village's forces, and the somewhat thinned-out internal security at most important facilities, it was the perfect time to take advantage of this. The benefits gained far outweighed the risks in case of capture, especially given the proven properties of the instrument of the future crime, making the task of detection, apprehension, and identification titanically difficult. Exiting meditation and feeling not a hint of nervousness that had gnawed at me deep inside all day, I glanced at the wall clock, it was 8 in the evening. Time. Forming the seal, I mixed energies in a long-established proportion and created my own copy, appearing at first glance as just a shadow. You know your task, I nodded to the shadow clone. Receiving a nod in response, I watched as the doppelganger transformed into a small mouse and, approaching the nearest shadow, absorbed into it without leaving a trace behind. Time began ticking. Along with it, the opportunity to prevent certain events in the future. Closing my eyes, I returned to meditation once again. Usually, the Hokage Tower security was maintained not only by an excellent security system based on Fuenjutsu but also by a large number of ANBU tasked with ensuring the safety not only of the village head but also of the village's bureaucratic apparatus, which had access to many important documents critical to Kanahagakur no Sato's well-being. At least, this was commonly believed among ordinary shinobi. It was not customary to remember that the Hokage himself would detect and eliminate assassins much earlier than his subordinates. Nor about the archive with documents located near the village's treasury, as well as the Hokage's personal library, true ANBU protected facilities. However, due to the wartime conditions, the reduction of available forces, and the not-so-bright situation on the fronts, the contingent of elite forces had stretched thinly across too many places requiring worthy defense during wartime. Therefore, only a couple of shinobi in animal masks stood guard at the doors to the previous and future Hokage's personal library. Normally, a full team of four was stationed here, including at least one weak sensor, but such abilities were in high demand in the war, leaving no room for such a fighter to remain in the rear. Moreover, the two ANBU guarding a multitude of forbidden and powerful techniques were green rookies. The protection personally established by Uzumaki Mido since the founding of Kanoha had never failed, despite its relative simplicity and age, if one could call one of the complex Uzumaki barriers simple at all. Hence, recent recruits were sent to this post, whose abilities were needed elsewhere, rather than veterans. All these factors, along with the inability of Kekiai Genkai to detect a creature almost entirely composed of a small amount of Yin Chakra, allowed the small dark mouse to enter the narrow ventilation space and then simply find the necessary room without attracting the attention of Shinobi. The ability to move through shadows over a considerable distance, as well as the weakened capabilities of a good sensor, made the infiltration surprisingly simple. Slipping through the grate and not hearing the sound of a siren after passing through the barrier, the mouse silently fell to the floor and began turning its head from side to side, surveying the many scrolls on the shelves. There were surprisingly few books in the library, and unlike the scrolls, they were not showing their age. Not finding the ultimate goal in sight, the transformed clone began inspecting the rest of the library and soon discovered a scroll of forbidden techniques in one of the corners of the room, behind a small cabinet labeled Forbidden on an attached piece of paper. Apparently, particularly unsightly techniques familiar to the Senju clan and past Hokages were stored here. Without any smoke and mirrors, the clone resumed its usual form and began examining the ultimate goal of its infiltration for additional traps, almost certainly present on the village's treasure. However, to the disappointment of the researcher, there was only one seal, merely allowing the detection of the scroll of forbidden techniques in case it was removed from the guarded premises. No security fuin, triggered upon opening, hidden traps on the shelf, or anything else. Nothing. 
Shrugging disappointedly several times, the clone took the scroll, unfolded it, and began searching for the required jutsu. Given the total length and number of entries, this turned out to be a rather time-consuming task, even if only reading the titles. Ten minutes later, having unfolded half of the paper canvas, the shadow clone stumbled upon what it was looking for. Edo Tensei. A jutsu capable of summoning the dead and forcing them to fight for the user. With a sacrifice and materials at hand, the possibilities of its application are limitless, as is the colossal headache if this knowledge falls into enemy hands. After reading a sufficiently lengthy description, which included quite a large number of seals applied to the vessel of the sacrifice, the clone literally memorized the text. Transforming its right hand into a dark blade, it carefully cleaned the dense paper, scraping off the top layer along with the ink without a trace. After a few minutes, an empty space adorned the middle of the scroll, with a small pile of paper shavings on the floor. Memorizing a couple more jutsu that caught its attention, the clone carefully transcribed the first intricate technique it came across onto the empty space from the bottom row of the forbidden cabinet nearby, rolled up the entire scroll, and returned it to its original position. The trash on the floor was then rolled into a small ball and swallowed, while the chakra construct began to meticulously delve into the contents of the cabinet. Considering its contents labeling, there could have been more than one copy of destroyed techniques on the shelves. It took about an hour of thorough inspection, but the efforts paid off, small, tattered scrolls without titles contained earlier and modified versions of Edo Tensei with numerous annotations. Judging by the initials left, they were the handiwork of the second Hokage, Senju Tobarama. The findings met the same fate as the trash a little earlier, and the clone nodded in satisfaction before retreating to the darkest corner of the room, slowly sinking into the shadow, taking its loot with it. The disappearance, like the infiltration, went completely unnoticed by both the guards and sensory seals designed to detect sources of ordinary chakra. The appearance of a shadow in the alley opposite the Hokage Tower, as well as its subsequent disappearance a couple of seconds later, went unnoticed by anyone. Feeling the presence of familiar chakra nearby, I opened my eyes and glanced at the clone that had risen from the floor a couple of steps away. It seemed the little adventure went without a hitch. The clone dispersed at my command, and I absorbed memories and the scrolls that had fallen to the floor along with the paper trash. Hmm, if I had known it would be so easy, I would have infiltrated the Hokage's library long ago. Especially considering the minor check on penetration in my own shop and home. This was how I discovered a small flaw in standard barriers that allowed me to use such a loophole. Given that my clones are almost undetectable by sensors that didn't create them, the risk factor was minimized. There were only some doubts about the protection on the scrolls themselves, but here, too, it turned out to be empty. Of course, considering the capabilities of ordinary thieves, even shinobi ones, Mito's creation is ultra-reliable, but Intan and Yotan have never been ordinary. However, it plays into my hands. Now I just have to hope that Auric hasn't already rummaged through his teacher's caches. Smirking, I picked up the scrolls and carefully reviewed them. I destroyed the earlier version and sealed the later one with a few in on my left hand. Such knowledge is better kept in mind or on the body to prevent what happened before. Besides, if anyone accidentally sees it, they'll start asking uncomfortable questions, even if that someone turns out to be Saya. It's better to err on the side of caution. Gathering all the resulting paper trash, I burned it in a specially designated bowl, after which I took out two clean scrolls and transferred onto them another piece of loot from the same resource, which could come in handy much later. Task X for the near future is completed, and the two small bonuses only added to the enjoyment. How could you miss so badly, Danzo? Hiruzen Sarutobi shook his head sadly, surveying the surroundings. Once the second largest camp in Sushigakure's territory, it was now almost completely destroyed. Smoking ruins, piles of stone and earth used in techniques, still remained uncleared. The nature around was almost completely destroyed by fierce battles between shinobi, and in the place of what was once a green forest, there was now only churned earth with round craters from explosions, traces of already cooled lava, and even several huge pits with perfectly smooth walls, as if cut out by a giant scalpel. The latter clearly was the work of the Kekiai Tota of the third Suchikage, Anoki. Considering the most massive attack on Tsushigakure in the last six months, it was hard to expect a different outcome, but Shimura's scouts should have detected enemy forces several hours before the attack itself, rather than jumping at the alarm from sensory seals that were recently supplied from Konoha, albeit in quite small quantities. Hiruzen made a mental note to find out the source when he had time, as even one such seal at a temporary base had saved the lives of a considerable number of shinobi on several occasions during surprise enemy attacks. 
Given their ability to camouflage through techniques and move underground, Iwagakure no Sato remained the most unpleasant direct combat opponent. And good sensors were always in short supply, not to mention that they were often disabled first, alongside medics. Inazuki weren't always successful, and the vast majority of Hyuga were deployed in Suna and AIM for understandable reasons. However, even such a small advantage turned out to be sufficient to mobilize all forces and send a messenger with a message. Nevertheless, a third of all forces gathered in the camp were destroyed, and another third would not be able to continue the war soon, having received injuries incompatible with further service for the next few weeks or even months. Once again, they would have to prepare a convoy with severely wounded for Kanoha. With a tired sigh, the Hokage threw a final glance at the devastation and, turning around, headed towards the broken-down nearby reinforcement station and survivors. The only thing comforting in this situation was the even heavier losses suffered by IWA, expecting a much lighter battle against an unprepared opponent. That was where the good news ended, besides significant losses, Danzo had been severely injured and lost an eye in a clash with the Tsuchikage, and the main strategist of this front sector had been killed outright, overwhelmed by a dozen high-level shinobi who disregarded losses despite the efforts of those defending. This loss dealt a much greater blow to Konoha than the loss of replenishable masses of fighters. Good strategists don't grow on trees, and a veteran Nara who had survived the entire First Shinobi World War and even participated in clan wars was valued much more than several hundred chunin and a couple dozen jonin. Ultimately, in war, numerical advantage is neutralized if the strategist is unable to make effective use of it, which had been demonstrated on numerous occasions by IWA. Not that they had bad strategists, but the Naras noticeably outperformed them in this quality almost every time, confirming their reputation as brilliant commanders. Hey Shikaku, Ryo greeted his cousin wearily, nodding towards Akamichi and Yamanaka, hello folks. Hello Ryo, are you here on this troubled graveyard too? Nara replied with a voice lacking enthusiasm. Accept our condolences, Ryo, sighed Chuza, looking unusually without food in his hands. Over time, he had gained even more in volume and still towered over me in height, towering over everyone like a huge mound of flesh, though like most Akamichi. Thank you. Of course, I'll show up here, especially when dad is in such a state, I sighed heavily, glancing at the tearful women of the three clans standing aside, including Saya and Setsura. Who would have thought that after surviving the first shinobi war without serious injuries, grandpa would die in the second. Not that I was very attached to anyone besides Sai, but still family, as it is. However, with the total number of losses in the clan, it had become a routine matter. Not only him, Ryo, not only him. Indeed, besides the seven Naras, today they buried three more Yamanakas and nine Akamichis, the latest attack on IWA had cost our forces dearly, and the funerals had been going on for the past couple of days since the convoy with the wounded arrived. Throughout the war, I had been to the graveyard for our clan exactly 63 times for a known reason alone, and more than a hundred times for allies. About half were with closed coffins, and a third were empty altogether, there isn't always time on the battlefield to collect bodies, let alone identify a person by a pile of meat. But what weighed most heavily in terms of responsibility was the absence of the clan head, who had once again gone to the front after a short rest and still hadn't returned. This meant all organizational matters fell on the shoulders of our mothers, and Shikaku and I had to not only contribute as shinobi but also take care of clan affairs, trying to ease the burden on the women, who were not very emotionally stable due to grandfather's death. You look like hell, Ryo, Inoichi slapped me on the shoulder, you should rest sometimes, instead of pushing yourself so hard. Go to hell, Ichi. I'll deal with you after three days without sleep and a couple of light chakra depletions, I snapped. We could have allocated extra funds long ago for streaming education for non-shinobi or preparatory courses for those who want to acquire field skills, but no, there's no money. Yeah, but investing in new trading posts is okay? Damn greedy bastards. When can we finally get rid of them and do something right? Considering that part of the council currently ruling the village is made up of ordinary townspeople and not military affairs, what did you expect? Most clan heads are on the front lines, so we have to put up with problematic idiots until the Hokage and advisors return, my brother shrugged. Rumors are circulating that the hermits are being pressured and Suna will declare surrender in the coming months, which will ease our situation a bit, especially after Iwa's recent losses. The end of the war is near. Except you forgot about AIM and the other two hidden villages, there have been reports of significant movements near our borders by large numbers of Kumo Shinobi, and suspicious activities in the land of water, I replied. They should have recovered from their devastating defeats in recent years. 
Hardly, Kiri and Kuma will take at least another five years to recover before they can stand on equal footing with us and Iwagakure even after the war, Inoichi shook his head. They were severely shattered by the Uzumaki. At most, they might test us a couple of times, but that's about it. None of the big five will be able to afford a new war anytime soon. That's true, no one expected that, I agreed, swelling with pride at being involved in this event. Well, you can only be glad about the coolness of your father's relatives. At least now this clan, which I like so much, won't fade into obscurity. And soon, with Chakra Chains and Jinchuriki, they won't be scary at all. They haven't sent you to the front yet? I casually asked the trio. Sensei says it won't be until at least six months from now, Chuza spoke up, so we'll only participate towards the very end of the war. Just make sure you don't get yourselves killed out there, because burying you guys would be too much of a hassle, I sighed, playfully poking each of them. More like you just don't want to become the next clan head, you workaholic troublemaker, Shikaku chuckled, eliciting laughs from his teammates. Who's talking? You're just as eager to avoid that title and pass it on to me, I retorted with a grin, troublesome lazybones. Ryo, Shikaku, it's time, my brother cut in before the banter could go further, as we were called. Turning around, we noticed the crowd gradually dispersing, and the distraught, teary-eyed Saya and Setsura were making their way towards us. Oh, sorry Kachan, but we still have training to do today, my brother informed after quickly exchanging glances with his comrades. What kind of training? Didn't Sarutobi sensei release you? Aunt suspiciously asked, sniffing. Only for the first half of the day, so we're off, and without waiting for a response, the trio used Shunshin, leaving the distraught women behind. Damn it. Feeling a shiver down my spine, I turned my head and met the tear-filled gaze of two pairs of eyes. Damn. Letting out a resigned sigh, I smiled reassuringly and comfortingly embraced both of them by the shoulders. Let's go home, and I'll brew a strong tea with a few spoons of sugar, and you can rest from everything in peace and quiet. Thank you, Ryo-chan, if only Shikaku were as understanding and caring as you, Setsura murmured through her tears. Well, if I weren't so responsible, I'd slip away like my brother, serving as a handkerchief for tears until evening doesn't sit well with me. But since Shinisu is currently absent, I involuntarily have to play his role in some cases, because for some, it's just too troublesome. Yeah, and they still consider him the elder. That's my Ryo-chan. Saya beamed with a smile. Ka-chan, why do you still call me, Chan? I'm taller than you now, and you still keep, Chan ing me. I couldn't help but pout. Their response was just weak laughter from the inseparable couple. Oh well, tears won't wait. Resignedly hanging my head and towing a couple of recovering kunoichi along, I headed towards the clan quarter, muttering quietly to myself about life's injustices and the complete lack of respect, to the greater joy and mockery of my companions who were slowly but surely regaining their cheerfulness thanks to my efforts. Ha, Saya falls for it every time, and not just her. And why do I feel like I'll have to play such a role again in the future? There's at least another two years until the end of the war, and I don't believe not a single Nara will perish during that time. Considering that Ma is good friends with many in the clan, such emotional funerals won't be the last. And I'm certainly dreading the moment when Shinise or Setsura will be among the casualties. So, team, congratulations on completing your first C-rank mission, however simple it may have been, Kanade smiled at us as soon as we left the Hokage Tower, having successfully completed the mission and received the appropriate payment. Yeah, and it hasn't been a year. More than six months passed before we got a more serious assignment than walking dogs and babysitting. Considering that the higher status was only granted due to leaving the village, and otherwise nothing has changed, it's a very big achievement. Tsum sarcastically replied, with her silent pet support tucked away in her pocket. All right, no complaining, you haven't grown up to real missions yet, and I certainly don't want to attend your funerals later if you happen to run into Nukanins, Hyuga frowned, until you reach an acceptable level, we'll stick to village tasks, is that clear? The question was seasoned with a considerable amount of KI. Yes. Affirmative. Of course. Surveying us with a stern gaze, Kanade suddenly smiled. Since it's clear, I propose we celebrate the successful completion at a cozy bar, she clapped her hands in delight. Drinks? Rotaro asked skeptically. Actually, it's still early for us, and will they even let us in? Do you have a Hitai 8? Yes? Then you're adults and can drink, smoke, and visit brothels. Stop mumbling, you're shinobi and should know one of the ways most chunin and jonin relax. A bar is just a bar, I shrugged indifferently. I don't understand the enthusiasm of our instructor. Or does she want to laugh at her students who can't handle drinking? That could very well fit her character. Sighing, I followed the determinately cheerful girl and the puzzled teammates. 
Kanade didn't lead us far, heading from the square in front of the tower towards one of the main streets. After walking just a hundred steps, she turned towards an inconspicuous single-story building that didn't even have a sign. Nevertheless, this didn't stop Hyuga from barging in as if it were his own home. K-san, get ready for customers. Ignoring the overly excited Kunoichi, I surveyed the room we entered, a bar like any other, dimly lit near the walls. There was a counter, plenty of tables, and a bartender wiping glasses, that was the extent of the room's decor. There were few customers, all huddling in corners, whispering quietly without bothering others. Kanade-chan, raised an eyebrow an elderly man, setting aside his glass and peering intently in our direction, nodding understandingly a couple of moments later. Bringing your brood? Marking our first sea mission. You're one of the last in this batch, chuckled the bartender, nodding towards a nearby table. Not bad, at least they're all intact, murmured the mentor, we'll take four bottles of sake, please. And will they handle it? I have no doubt about the big one, but his friend seemed too lightweight. Glancing at my grimacing partners, I grinned beneath my mask, small fry. Not to worry, I'll handle them, so I'll get them home, dismissed the kunoichi, leaving money on the counter as she picked up the tray with our order. Placing a small bottle of 300 grams in front of each and a sake cup, Kanade took a seat at an empty chair and skillfully broke the wax seals on the necks, filling the cups to the brim. Well, let's start with the first and may all our missions proceed as quietly and smoothly. Suspiciously eyeing the poured liquid, I subtly grimaced, I once tried rice sake in that other life, and it's a rare nastiness, I must say, better to stick with regular water. But there you go, it's a different place, might as well give it a try. Taking the cup, I loosened my kimono collar and drank it straight through the mask, ignoring the table's amazed and disappointed faces, considering that none of the three had seen my face without the mask up to now, I understand their curiosity. Watching the universal disappointment of the mentor, the source of her good mood until recently, becomes evident. Well, this sake is definitely better than what I tried once. Anyway, it's drinkable without grimacing, if not the first time. Looking at the coughing partners and the puppy's turning face, I just laughed, and Sensei got at least some moral compensation for the mess I caused. Phew, what a nasty one, whispered Rotaro when he finally managed to catch his breath. How can you drink this? Not to worry, it's only the first time, you'll get to appreciate the beauty of this drink later, shook his head Hyuga, smiling. Especially after a tough mission, when you need to relax. And what else do they have besides various types of sake? I inquired, pouring another cup along with everyone and downing it in one gulp. For enthusiasts, various wines, responded the mentor, but most are too sweet for my taste. And liqueurs? For those, you'll have to go to the Sunagakir suppliers once the war is over, liquors are popular with them. Well, that's rather sparse. Considering my devotion to tasty drinks rather than just alcohol, looks like I'll have to come up with something myself. However, the necessary alcohol is there, and making vodka out of it shouldn't be a problem. Pour in those plums growing in the garden and after some time, you'll have a delicious homemade liqueur. I also read a recipe for mead once, though I've never tried it. In general, there's room for experimentation, and I'll make sure to provide myself with drinks, especially since I've never really been a heavy drinker, appreciating not the consequences, but the taste of the beverage consumed. We spent quite a while in the bar, simply chatting and sharing rumors, actually, without television and radio, it was the only way to find out the latest events, and an excellent exercise in gathering information in one go. People subtly gathered closer towards the evening, and somewhat unexpectedly for myself, I discovered my partner's heads on the table and several bottles of sake next to each. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.